অরিন্দম গুড মর্নিং সবাইকে গুড মর্নিং গুড মর্নিং দিদি আচ্ছা রাঘব বাড়ি কোথায় গুড মর্নিং ডক্টর ঘোষ গুড মর্নিং গুড মর্নিং Now we are starting our today's session. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the third and last day of the international webinar on translational physiology from cell to system, organized by Department of Physiology, Anandu Mohan College. There were three lectures in first day of the webinar, and the speakers were Professor Tushar Kanti Ghosh, Professor B.N. Mollik, and Professor Nilkanto Chakraborty. The speakers of the second day session were Dr. Shura Bhattacharya, Dr. Alok Kumar Chakraborty, and Dr. Sabana R. Choudhury. There are four lectures in today's session, and the speakers of today's session are Dr. Vishwarup Ghosh, Research Instructor and Adjunct Professor, Thomas Jefferson University, Philadelphia, USA, Dr. Monomita Patro, Assistant Professor, Los Rios Community College, Sacramento, California, USA, Dr. Niladri Bhomik, Associate Toxicologist, Department of Pesticide Regulation, California, EPA, USA, and Dr. Kubali Dhar, Head of the Department, Department of Home Science, University of Calcutta. Now, I would like to invite today's first speaker, Dr. Vishwarup Ghosh, to deliver his talk. The topic of his presentation is Cervical Spinal Cord Injury and Respiratory Compromise. Therapeutic strategies addressing neuroprotection and regeneration. Before his presentation, I would like to request Dr. Arindam Dalal, Assistant Professor of our department and the Organizing Secretary of this webinar to introduce Dr. Ghosh. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee. Good morning, everyone. Today, our first speaker is Dr. Vishwarup Ghosh. Dr. Ghosh is a translational neuroscientist. After completion his B.Sc. and M.Sc. degree in physics and biophysics from Kulan University, he obtained his Ph.D. degree in biochemistry from the same university. Then he joined as a postdoc research associate in the University of Minnesota in the year of 2009. And there he discovered first time a novel kinase signaling pathway that modulate calcium homeostasis in DRG neuron following injury. From 2012 to 2014, he was involved as a research associate in Temple University, Philadelphia, USA, in the field of neuroscience, particularly Parkinson's disease and restoration of motor behavior. In 2014, he joined Hefferson University and now he is working as a research instructor with the current research focus on Parkinson's disease, ALS, spinal cord injury, and neuropathic pain. 
He has published 25 peer-reviewed international publications in world-renowned journals like Journal of Neuroscience, Fabs J, Journal of Neurophysiology, Glia, and so on. Dr. Ghosh has an another side. He is the founder of a health sign website, neurocardhealth.in, which promote authentic regarding biomedical research and development. Dr. Ghosh, we cordially welcome you. Now the platform is yours. Over to Dr. Ghosh. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, uh, give my acknowledgement to the organizing committee. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I'm really grateful to Joita Banerjee for, uh, for this opportunity because she came to me and with this uh, opportunity. And I'm really happy uh, to be to this webinar to present my translational work. Basically, the webinar is translational physiology for cell to system. So today, uh, I I'll present basically the work on uh, spinal cord injury, it's totally on sp uh, translational work, like on animal model. So uh, I'm going to uh, present my PowerPoint. And today, because there are a lot of students there with me, so uh, I'd like to mention a very simple version way. And I would like to uh, explain how we think about research, basically how we approach research. So I will go one by one. So today, uh, basically, my project, my project on spinal cord injury. So, uh, spinal cord injury is a great, is a burden for us right now. If you have spinal cord injury, the cost of living and the responsibility of social responsibility for the family is really, really, is very concerning point. So every day we have spinal cord injury. It's happened due to car accident. It happens due to violence. It, ha it happens due to a lot of factors in our daily life. So what happened basically due to spinal cord injury and cervical rhythm? Our research focus on cervical rhythm uh, of spinal cord. So what happens if there is an injury in spinal cord injury, uh, cervical region? So there is a basically a circuit, there is a circuit that is called phrenic motor circuit. So if there is any insult due to external forces, that is any injury occurred in spinal cord. So we so respiratory compromise, a lot of people give respiratory compromise uh, with the ventilator, and several people die. So we are thinking to, uh, to do research on this so that we can restore the diaphragm function. Respiratory compromise, respiratory compromise. Yes, respiratory compromise, to understand respiratory compromise, you have to understand the phrenic motor circuit basically. So phrenic motor circuit, I'm just uh, explaining very briefly so that in inter research what i will explain you will understand better so the phrenic motor neuron the phrenic motor circuit is not only in brain stem it is cervical region and diaphragm so in three parts how the rostral ventral respiratory group neurons which is present in the brain stem it is connected to the phrenic motor neuron and the cervical spinal cord. Then it project axons to the diaphragm. When any signal comes from the brain, and we have to access to the spinal cord. So if there is any kind of injury occurred, so the signals getting dis disturbed, you know, so paralysis may happen of the diaphragm. 
So you can see the image here. What kind this kind this kind of cervical spinal cord injury may happen. So our research basically, um, I published five um, first of six publications on spinal cord injury. Different kind of approach, uh, protections along with regeneration. So there are two kinds of injury model. I was talking about spinal cord injury translational model. We do animal research. So translational research basically based on animal uh, study in vitro study jointly and then clinical research based on beyond of translational research like preclinical research you know then it goes to human so that is the clinical trial so we do in research in university as a researcher we do basically the translational research on spinal cord to get some knowledge or to get some novel invention so that uh, you know, new direction, a new hypothesis, a new uh, drug target. We can uh, we can get in uh, for uh, like you know for for drug discovery. So that's why we uh, uh, that's why if, the, if you are a student, you can consider in a research when you uh, will consider research, you will uh, you will select a topic. Let us suppose uh, a problem. What is the problem? So based on the problem, you will design your research, and then. You will design your research um, um, protocol, and then you will uh, uh, you will address the questions. What questions? Now that is the hypothesis. Uh, that is the uh, aims. You know, so to uh, get some therapeutic uh, to get some therapeutic uh, uh, solutions, right? So you have to go. You have to uh, uh, address different kind of uh, different kind of. You have to um, address different kind of problems, um, or or you have to address. Let us suppose uh, for respiratory compromise, spinal cord injury. So there is a problem is respiratory compromise. So how you will address it, right? So let us suppose you are uh, uh, let us suppose you are giving some um, drug. Okay. So now respiratory compromise need to be restored right so you have to measure the respiratory respiratory functions so you need some electrophysiological method that means what i want to say you have to design such experiment so that you can visualize uh, visualize and you can get some data so that you can compare uh, the benefit benefit means uh, the restoration of the functions so so we are addressing respiratory uh, respiratory functions so you can see this is our experimental model. So now, what is the problem we are addressing? We have we are addressing this, um, spinal cord injury and respiratory compromise. So we have two kinds of model. I'm I'm coming two types of model, but we have uh, like this is a model. Uh, this is a study we did. Like we use local BDNF uh, delivery with a, a novel drug uh, hydrogen. Like what we uh, basically engineered. Engineer specifically for uh, local BDNF uh, to administer uh, BDNF locally at the injury sites. So we did uh, so many um, uh, electrophysiological and living animals to address the diaphragm functions. So that is CMAP recording, compound muscle action potential. We uh, we we, uh, we did EMG recording. That is electromyography recording. That is all our electrophysiological measure to address. Uh, the hypothesis uh, whether uh, let us suppose from injury there is an EMG uh, uh, amplitude. So we are giving let us suppose tre uh, treatment so the EM EMG amplitude is uh, restoring or it is not restoring. Is restoring that means it is functionally improving in a living animal. So that kind of approach generally we do uh, for any kind of research finding. So you have to correlate the data uh, what you are looking for. So we have different weeks. At the initial first, we do injury. We have two kinds of model. One is contusions model, and uh, one is a hemisections model. So in the cont contusions model, uh, we do um, we are coming. That is the contusions uh, in infinite horizon impactor. So <clears throat> you can see in a rat. So there is a computerized uh, programs. So we can use different kind of force. So uh, you can see the tips, and uh, you can see the tips. Uh, you 
the tips uh, we, uh, that can be impacted on the spinal cord of the rat and make injury. So that is um, that is called uh, contusions injury. So uh, we have this model. So this is we initially open the rat and we, we go to the proper place in the spinal cord. In the, <coughs> we have a midline, you can easily see the panel B and then there is C3, C4, C5. So our model is we impacted uh, in the C4 uh, region. Okay, but if it is one side. We are injuring, making in the spinal cord in one side. See, uh, that is just uh, in a broad view. You can, um, uh, that is the contusions model. We prepare in the lab. So now, the most important thing what we did, uh, we everybody knows BDNA, brain derived neurotrophic factor. And it has some uh, neuroprotective effect. It has some excitability effect. Everything is fine. But you cannot use BDNF as a systemic injection because systemic injections goes to throughout the body in a different uh, place. And, and then uh, what will happen? Uh, it may uh, induce so many other side effects. So that's why BDNF in generally, uh, it is uh, nobody uh, like BDNF uh, to use systemic injections BDNF. So we want to uh, we want to address uh, how we we'll use BDNA. So we engineered a hydrogel, which is basically uh, formed with a uh, dexan sulfate uh, and chitosan, uh, which is conjugated with BDNA. So it's the electrostatic interactions happen between this uh, 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 dextran sulfate and chitosan, and then we form these complexes as a hydrogel. So this hydrogel we used at the focal injury point. Uh, then uh, we wait for uh, several weeks to measure uh, the functional recovery of the diaphragm. So now, PDF we are using focal point. It is it is needed to know whether the BDNF is effective or bioactive for longer time. Okay, so we had, uh, we try to find uh, find it out. So it, uh, we, we did a cell culture model, which uh, we, uh, we tried to get uh, whether it is uh, active, bio, um, biologically active for or BDNA is released. So this is the experiment uh, initially for BDNA release. You can see it is uh, BDNA is releasing in the day, in day 17, up to 17, it is uh, getting released. So uh, we uh, so longer time, that means two and a half weeks, uh, we have, uh, if only one time we injected BDNF, and in the initial first two days, it is high, releasing high, then slowly, it's a constant, consistent way, uh, it is releasing some amount of BDNF. So, in the focal injury point, we are continuously providing BDNF with a control dosing system. So, uh, so that's the, that's the great um, the model, like the uh, new one kind of inventions for, from our lab. Uh, and this paper basically uh, is uh, a lot of media forward in the US, uh, the published in the Journal of Neuroscience, this paper. So this is also, we uh, want to see uh, the, the BDNA, which is releasing from the hydrogel, which we engineered. Uh, it is like bioactive, but it's bioactive, actively active. So it is biologically active. So uh, in a study, in a, in a cortical neuron culture, uh, culture cell, you can see it is all a cortical uh, uh, neural culture, uh, and then we use hydrogen peroxide for inducing neurotoxicity or uh, killing the cell basically in a, uh, in a simple term. And then we uh, want to see uh, whether compared with fresh BDNA and a release BDNA. So we use a little bit fresh BDNA externally added in the medium and the cell culture. And then we found it, yeah, it is uh, living longer time. And then we also use the release BDNA. Uh, BD, uh, BDNF. Uh, it is also the similar kind of um, uh, uh, <coughs> survival when a neural viability we observe a similar kind of neural viability. So that's why uh, we found what we prepared as a tool uh, that is biologically active and it is released long time. So now uh, I told you we have in a research we have to figure out how to. Uh, how to uh, compare your data or how to uh, measure, you know, whatever, whatever you are looking. We are looking for a respiratory compromise. So our electrophysiology, we are measuring electrophysiology, that is electromyography. 
So we have two groups now. One is control group and one is experimental group. So in a control group, basically that is blank hydrogel. Let us, there is no billion above there. And in the, in the experimental group, we, we have billion of hydrogen. So it was treated in two groups, okay? So now we are, uh, we are uh, during uh, four or five weeks later, we are comparing the electrophysiology before the sacrifice the rats for immunohistological study, like, you know, to isolate the spinal cord, uh, the brain, uh, to do other kind of studies, immunohistological studies I'm coming later. So, so we measure the electrophysiology. So we found, let us suppose, this is a uh, blank hydrogen and this is BDNF hydrogel, treated BDNF hydrogel. So uh, local BDNF delivery basically, uh, using engineered hydrogel, it enhanced the diaphragmatic respiratory function. So uh, you can see uh, the panel C, uh, panel A and B, there is a huge difference between the uh, <clears throat> between the spike of the EMG. And the, we measure the amplitude and uh, you find, look, there is with the dorsal, dorsal region, there is a significant difference of uh, blank gel versus BDNF. You, you, you may see there is ventral and median region is not significantly different between control group and BDNF group. So uh, there should, you should, should have questions, right? So basically we, our model is C4. We are making C4 injury and that C4 uh, is connected uh, to the dorsal region of the diaphragm. So the diaphragm, um, we measure three, uh, like there is diaphragm is three portions, right? Having three portions, that is ventral, medial, and dorsal. So when we measure the uh, when we measure the EMG in the, in the dorsal region, we find there is a significant restoration of the uh, using the BDNF. But the other places, that is ventral and medium, there is no differences because that portions are intact for both groups. So it is uh, like you know it, it. So that way we are comparing and we are analyzing our data uh, based on the anatomy. And based uh, based on the our you know uh, uh, experimental protocol and experimental data we are analyzing. Now we also used compound action muscle potential. So there is a <coughs> there, <coughs> there is a instrument um, through through that we measure it. We externally basically we have some thin electrode we injected in the uh, in the neck muscle. And then we stimulate it externally with uh, with a machine, one kind of some voltage we give it. So that's why. So uh, in the in in the uh, cervical spinal cord, there are phrenic motor neurons, right? I, I told in the initial uh, initial time. So the phrenic motor neuron get uh, activated, like so. You will find the compound muscle action potential on the diaphragm. So we measure it. So uh, <clears throat> then we find. Every week from following the injury and following the treatment, we generally uh, measure the CMAP. So we found the amplitude of the CMAP for blank gel and BDNF. First week, it was not statistically significant because they need to some recovery. They need to, um, they need to get some animal need to be healthy. Initial point after injury, they, uh, they don't eat too much. Uh, they, uh, they two, three days, they, uh, they become very uh, like you know, very weak, and then after one week, they become little bit, little bit, little bit normal. So uh, from the second week and third week, there is a robust, significant uh, <coughs> increase on the CMAP amplitude due to application of the BDNF. And this is the uh, amplitude measure in the uh, when we measure, we get like this kind of uh, spike. So you can see this is the blank gel. And this is the uh, ipsilateral gel. So we amplitude measure basically from here to here. This is the amplitude. And you can see this is the amplitude is more. So that is basically in graphical represented as here. So uh, this way we found BDNF increases both action potent and uh, CMAP and EMG. And that means it is restoring the diaphragm. Now, I told during the after the sacrifice we um, we, we we isolate the spinal cord. We do sections and then we do a lot of immunohistological study to find the signals, uh, to find the cause. You know, to find any kind of um, any kind of uh, hints 
like uh, for what it is happening you know to um, to find the molecular molecular uh, mechanism so uh, then now uh, you can see here uh, we, we try to measure the lesion size so we made a lesson right in some area we impacted uh, with the with the contusion injury so we try to measure the lesion size but we find the both group have the same kind of lesion size that means BDNF itself is not new, uh, protective on the spinal cord initially, uh, on the spinal cord. Like the central limb protection is not available with the BDNF. So how then, uh, if there is no limb protection, how we are getting, uh, uh, how we are getting <coughs> the diaphragm restoration, uh, functional restorations? So that is the question we need to address. So now we are searching what may be the cause. So that's the research basically. You have to search for what may be, what may be. Is this? Is this? So we have to uh, try different way to find a different kind of mechanism. So now uh, this is a uh, this is an, a very interesting thing. Uh, you, this is the cell we level in the spinal cord specifically for feeding motor neurons. So how we did level? So we injected there is some retrograde pressure uh, in the intracrural uh, intracrural space of the diaphragm. And that is um, uh, that is CT beta, cholinotropin beta. So cholinotropin beta retrogradually come from the from uh, from there, uh, and it basically specifically specifically level the phrenic motor neuron in the spinal cord. It will not level any other neurons. So when we cut the spinal cord and when we stand, we can easily see easily see the phrenic motor neuron we leveled. You know. So then we count the phonic motor neuron between two groups, and we found um, there is uh, there is BDNF group have more phonic motor neurons. Now, BDNF group having more phonic motor neurons, how? Maybe may have some. Um, then it comes from the labeling occurred. How? It comes like the CT beta comes from the uh, diaphragm, right? That means from diaphragm to uh, spinal cord, there are uh, there are axons. I told you in the initial circuit, uh, the phrenic motor axons goes to diaphragm. That means there is some innervation, uh, innervation, and that innervation are uh, intact. So that's why a lot of uh, phrenic motor neuron in the BDNA group basically get it. Uh, we get um, leveling. So there are some um, there are some uh, innervation. Uh, that innervations are intact, like it's not degenerated. So that's why we got more um, CT beta level phrenic motor neuron at the spinal cord. Now this is this is a neuromuscular junction. So neuromuscular junction staining. This is very important study. So how I told you, you can see that green all all over. So that are the axons coming from the spinal cord to the basically um, diaphragm. So that axons, we can uh, we all entirely like two antibodies, SMI32 for neurofilament and SB2, <coughs> the vesicle, uh, <coughs> synaptic vesicle tube. So we uh, we uh, we do stain with al alpha bangrotoxin, alpha bangrotoxin in the red. So that is basically <coughs> on the nicotinic acetylic um, uh, receptor uh, on the diaphragm okay so now you can easily see uh, the pd is partially denervated look the green is not inside so when you march you will see intact look here how my cursor is all are looking yellow that means all the axons are making inside you know with the neuromuscular junction they form neuromuscular junction. So it is eulus, right? So it is intact. Look, this is less eulus. So less intact. That is partially denervated, right? This is intact. So we counted all the, all the kind of these neuromuscular junctions, whether it is in a, uh, intact, partially denervated, and fully denervated. Look, this is the fully denervated in A. Uh, look, my cursor. So there is a uh, disconnection. The green. Axon is disconnected from the neuromuscular junction, right? So there is, so that is fully denervated. So then we come, then we compare. 
percentage of intact NMJs. So we found the dorsal region, we have more percentage of uh, percentage of intact neuromuscular junction for the using BDNM, where uh, partially denervated NMJs uh, are less for BDNF treatment. And completely denervated NMJs are very less for BDNF treatment. So that means BDNF keeping uh, <coughs> one kind of um, more contacts or keeping the, uh, the neuromuscular junctions more intact okay so that's why we are getting basically the ct beta level neuron in the spinal cord more now we are looking for uh, any other molecular mechanism whether um, for um, for the functional recovery so you can you can easily see that there is a serotonergic action 5 ht uh, basically, serotonergic signal uh, is uh, is responsible for uh, one kind of one kind of synaptic activity of neurons. So, in both group, this is the blank group. That is, we I, uh, uh, we have two groups. One is experimental group. One is kind of, uh, one is experimental group, and one is control group. So, in the control group, there is um, and the experimental group, there is upregulation of five ht actions. Okay, so in you, you will found the 5 ht upregulated. So now these are the CT beta level neuron, CT beta level neuron. So we measure the CT beta basically uh, level neuron. So you can easily see this is the blank and this is the 5 ht So more, we counted number of 5 ht axons profile. So number of 5 ht axon profile, we get more total um, axons around the funding motor neuron in different range is all are uh, like you know in, in increase uh, due to BDNF treatment. So 5 ht uh, sprouting uh, around the funding motor neuron was observed due to the BDNF treatment. So this is another kind of study I did, like another project which is published neuro, uh, neuro, uh, another uh, journal, Neurobiology of Disease. So we, we use basically minocycline, another kind of drug uh, is for, it is approved drug for acne, but we used different kind of drug. Here, we did not found any difference of 5-HT, you know, you can see both group, blank and minocycline, but the same approach, same kind of um, act, uh, <coughs> experimental design, everything same, but we, we conjugated the gel, hydrogel with different, uh, <coughs> different minocycline, okay? So if, here you, you we did not find any kind of difference of 5 ht uh, uh, sprouting. So that's why, like, you know, we, 5 ht may have role on BDNF induced restoration of diaphragm functions. So now we, we need to prove it, like how, whether it is synaptically active, because synaptically activations we needed to check. So that means we, we can find some, uh, we can find some, so we, <laughs> we can find some syn uh, synaptophysin with 5 ht with CT beta. So let's, this is the CT beta label uh, printing motor neuron cell body. And on the cell body, uh, CT beta, 5 ht and synaptophysin, uh, they are overlapping. They are overlapping. So we compare between two groups, between blank gel and BDNF hydrogel, whether these three are overlapping. Then we found BDNF had more than 5 ht synaptophysin presynaptic terminal per CT beta friending motor neuron soma. So that is maybe the main cause for um, getting uh, getting um, the more uh, restorations due to BDNF. So BDNF not only uh, synaptically active uh, creates the activations of the friending motor neurons, but also it preserves the uh, uh, the actions which is coming from the friending motor neuron. Uh, and and which is uh, making uh, the the neuromuscular junction with the uh, uh, at the diaphragm. So this is the findings basically. Um, is a, a novel kind of finding. We uh, and we we got, got really a lot of uh, media coverage in America on this paper. So now we want to go regeneration based project. That is one kind of neuroprotection kind of project. So I want to mention another uh, project, which is neuro uh, regenerations. So uh, in animal model, regeneration is really hard, and human regeneration is hard too. 
so in a rat is a, it is also very hard mouse is little bit uh, mouse uh, rat is more hard than mouse you can easily find a regeneration in mice but it is also hard for a rat uh, so we tried for rat so we did uh, basically i um, i published two papers mark and uh, me and the both uh, both co first of all uh, in two papers so this is one kind of uh, protein tyrosine phosphatase sigma inhibitor peptide so we use here systematic injections um, uh, of i'd like to uh, present this paper that is a uh, four based um, paper so <laughs> we got long distance axon regenerations we use pap4 what is pap4 pap4 is an antagonist of p10 okay so p10 inhibit intrinsic regeneration so this is the main story so now we design customize we customize a pap4 we we, we customize so many pep, uh, peptides then we standardize which which um, pap4 basically is more good so uh, we got pap4 we designed this pap4 that works very well uh, for our system so then we tried with that so now this is the experimental model we use lot of viruses to track the neuronal circuit so this is the phonic motor circuit right so phonic motor circuit is intact in the a this is the intact so rnrg that is the rostral ventral respiratory group neuron present here in the brain stem it project acts on to the towards the cervical spinal cord and it makes uh, a synapse at the spinal cord and then the phonic motor neuron which are located in the c3 to c5 it, it project acts on to the diaphragm and the brain signal which comes there in respiratory signal comes there then diaphragm contracts so that is the way of our respiration right so now any kind of any kind of lesions so this is the model we are doing hemisection so look this is the central uh, this is, we we have both sides so one side we are making hemisection with a knife sharp knife so this side we are making hemisection so that this axon cannot pass through right so the challenge is to make this axon regenerate through the lesion side okay through the lesion side so now uh, we use amm chain so we we inject basically in the brain stem stereotactically inject in the brain stem so that that axons can be level with m chain that means it red it is suppose a red line axon so you can easily track whether that red uh, axons is going um, uh, is uh, is stop here or it crossing the lesions a uh, lesion so that's the way you can uh, we can we can track the axon with specific axon not any other axon the specific axon which are basically uh, carrying the signal from the brain so we do the same way we do uh, emg recording for restorations to compare the uh, compare the functions uh, so <coughs> we do emg we do uh, cmap okay and we do ct beta leveling like we uh, again we uh, this we are specifically label this ax this cells phenic motor neuron by injecting here ct beta okay then ct beta goes through this way and it level all the phenic motor neurons so we can easily track the phenic motor neuron here level and the axon we are leveling here so when these two two levels will we, we can see here so we can easily track the total spinal cord circuits like the phenic motor circuits uh, which is responsible for diaphragm function so that is the uh, uh, experimental model and that is the way we can track all the uh, necessary parts of the phonic motor neuron look this is the real in the lesson side this is we make lessons complete one side lessons one side is lesson and we uh, we <coughs> we measure the lesson side between two groups we find is is similar kind of rostral to cavern width of the lesions this width we measure this width is similar okay so now i told you m cherry injection in the brain stem this is the particular place where we injected m cherry a m cherry so so that is uh, m cherry you can easily track with its uh, stereotactic injection now 
you can easily see the g uh, g fat that is uh, the gl scar if you have injury uh, there will be gl scar so we need even to measure whether um, uh, both groups are equal kind of injury if you have if, if you don't have equal kind of injury then you are um, uh, you are uh, you are not doing experiment properly okay so <clears throat> because you will compare the data based on the similar uh, similar situation similar kind of um, experimental condition so we are doing the similar kind of injury for both groups uh, one group will be treated with dmso and one group will be with the pap4 that pap4 we customize which is the antagonist of p10 and p10 is the inhibitor of intrinsic regenerative factor so we are modulating the intrinsic uh, mod, um, uh, regeneration factor so that we are uh, we can get uh, the restorations of diaphragm, uh, diaphragm function following the spinal cord injury at the cervical region so using systemic and uh, systemic uh, injections um, uh, for with the pap4 for three weeks continuously in two times in 12 hours interval so we found uh, we found gmso have you know totally paralyzed that side on kind of because we are making but when we did shift pap4 is again we getting spike so, so it's getting restores now i told last time we have in that run there is three reasons basically ventral medial and dorsal so we measured the limits way we found the dorsal uh, medial and ventral you know basically three reasons we got there is a restorations of the diaphragm function following treatment of p uh, pap4 so now we find whether there is any uh, morphological innervation of the diaphragm is affected or not so we found for the both group dmso uh, intact dmso and pap4 like uh, dmso and pap4 there is no alterations because we are making the injury here the c2 hemisections this is called c2 hemisections so we are not touching c3 to c5 so we are uh, we are uh, touching the c2 hemisection region the c2 region and that's why all the connections between the uh, uh, between the Schrodinger motor neuron and the neuromuscular junction and the diaphragm all are intact. So there is no alterations of the morphological innervation or functional innervations. This is very interesting finding. So uh, look at here, here, here. In the, this is the injury site. First, let's just G panel and H, uh, H panel. These are the injury sites. Okay. These are the caudal, but towards the C3 to C5 region. And these are E and C. These are the region for C, uh, uh, C1, like from brain stem, like that one. Okay. So this is the injury side, basically C2. So look for the DMSO used. Initially, we track all the axons. I told you uh, we are using M cherry, uh, M cherry AV virus to track the particular RBRG axon. So RBRG axon is getting stopped in the before the injury they are just stopping okay pap4 look they pass through they pass through the lesion side h is the lesion side so they are passed through in the g this is the lesion side for dma so there is nothing so look this is the caudal caudal means c3 to c5 region the lesion they crosses lesion uh, side uh, and then uh, again it is going towards the c3 to c5 region so that's the thing so pap using pap4 we got robust regenerations and which crossing which is crossing through the lesion side and now the question is whether it is making uh, synaptic connections with the phonic motor neuron at c3 to c5 without synaptic connection it is not possible to have functionally at the fun uh, to get the functional restoration so again we do vglue 2 a presynaptive um, <coughs> excitatory uh, presynaptic marker M cherry, M cherry for the axon and CT beta. We level CT beta, the specific phonic motor neuron as red. So you will found all are basically present here. You can see this is the R panel. So they are making synapse, what I told last time. So that's the thing. The CT beta, M cherry and VGLU2, M cherry. How you name it? 
we injected in the brain stem so we are getting m cherry uh, m cherry axon uh, that means the axon rvg axon terminal right we level rvg axon that means the axon is not only crossed they already made synapse with the phonicoton neuron at the c3 to c5 region that's why there is a robust restoration of the diaphragm function uh, using the pap4 that is the same uh, is little bit more uh, more way you can easily see five, oh there is also the 5 ht uh, uh, 5 ht that is the serotonergic axon uh, up regulations at the phonic motor neuron pool so both way uh, we found uh, that it is um, it is basically um, making synaptic connections and functional restorations due to the pap4 is the same way we did the leveling. Now this is very interesting. Uh, now the question is, you are using pap systemic injection, whether from the other side, it is coming to the this side, right? Yes. So that's why we, we did a relation study. That's a very good valid question. So relation study means, let us suppose we are measuring EMG at the end of the experiment. We, we got the restorations, this the spike increases. If we release and again, then again measure the EMG. If we get similar, then all the activation from contralateral side, from it is coming other side. If it's totally blunted, immediately blunted, then it crosses from the ipsilateral side, that is the side of injury and make synaptic connections. So DMS of pre-lesions and DMS of post-lesions is look similar, okay? So this is the pre-lesions, relation. When we, we did the, again, we got at the end of the experiment, we got this is the, uh, PAP, using the PAP4, we are getting the data. So now we put, again cut the uh, uh, same place. We do relation. Suddenly the spike, the EMG drops. That means, What's the activation we are getting is due to the, <clears throat> the RVRG axon which crosses the lesion side. That's, that's the very interesting finding. Um, and that's the uh, yes, paper we published in the e Neuro Journal of Neuroscience. Uh, so now, my three bosses, great bosses, they are my three bosses, Stan Thayer. Uh, for University of Minnesota, Dr. George Smith, uh, Temple University, Angelo Lafaro, Jefferson University. So basically, um, I learned not only in vitro biology or neuroscience, but also in vivo biology of neuroscience. Uh, I did PhD on biochemistry, and here I'm totally last 10 years was doing neuroscience. I covered a wide range of neuroscience research, Parkinson research, spinal cord injury research, ALS research, some part of vivo, neuropathic pain research. Uh, so I'm really fortunate I uh, I got this opportunity. So now I'd like to encourage the students the entrepreneurship journey. I started an entrepreneurship journey also in parallel. So initially last two years ago, well in through last two years I'm developing a, a health science website. Uh, it is not only in English but also in Bangla. Uh, because Bangla is my Matri Vasa. Whatever. So, uh, <clears throat> so, I want to say yeah, I stand against infodemic during the corona pandemic because a lot of misinformation was there. So, I work hard. I have a great team, basically 10 15 people I have team uh, who work part timely uh, and, and we, uh, we are continuously uh, publishing uh, very. Uh, authentic informations which are very authentic and then um, very limited although it's not like per day 10 15 news no maybe uh, two days three days one news as per our capacity but we want to bring the science for the layman if you go any blog from newcradhealth.in you will find it different so this is the bangla so basically I want to promote Bengali health science. 
so that's why uh, my website you can easily turn to the bangla website so i made two character because nobody want to hear signs and especially on health nobody cares until they have they, they uh, suffered or they have some problem in their family they don't want to learn health signs uh, so that's why i make two character one is bikuladu one is beladidi so ventriloquist uh, polas maybe you know miracle uh, he is very famous from miracle a program of gtv so polas is doing uh, big as a bikuladu ventriculist and bela did this different kind of funny kind of face uh, sound is changed like that way we bring different video communications for the layman to uh, bring awareness on different kind of uh, uh, um, authentic informations like this is a program like dengue or dengue with a sabdhan right you know this kind of information we we, uh, we bring in video communications uh, with the uh, authentic information not one two this is my consulting company i made in us and i provide uh, some support for uh, different small companies in us also and uh, doing some uh, connecting outsourcing uh, research and development within filing human resource i have so many uh, collaborations right now and this is the startup i am developing in india right now maybe in january it will be available app development is uh, is going on so right now it will be in telemedicine and medical tourism and health care related the app is coming later other part will be connected so uh, i would like to ask all student who will follow this uh, my lecture you can uh, con uh, connect with me because a lot of phd student a lot of phd uh, completed uh, and general level uh, are connected with me who are interested for entrepreneurship program with new grad health so we are offering a new uh, new grad health in micro entrepreneurship program so we will make them inter, uh, independent entrepreneur uh, by basically uh, in, in connected with new grad health hub uh, in different project no investment there is no money there is no franchise money <laughs> there is uh, nothing is required uh, what uh, i am making a different kind of platform for people uh, which will be you know um, already 40 people uh, i am uh, training them every day every week i am training and um, 40 people right now they are getting training and they will join when i uh, launch uh, so they will provide uh, services um, in their places basically okay so that's the thing thank you very much uh, for this opportunity if you have uh, Uh, any questions regarding science regarding entrepreneurship uh, entrepreneurship program new grad help gmail com uh, you can uh, contact me and if you uh, want to write uh, bengali health science like you are a student you want to write uh, just contact me uh, there is a lot of part time job opportunity with me right now so thank you very much just a minute thank you very much dr ghosh for your nice and informative lecture and sparing your midnight time for us now uh, so i am wondering whether i take more time <laughs> okay in now the beginning in the beginning i was too slow because i was little bit uh, one kind of sleepy in the beginning then i got uh, <laughs> okay uh, thank you once again and now uh, question answers uh, we will send you if there are uh, some questions uh, now we are mm -hmm. moving to the next section of our webinar yes. the next speaker of today's presentation is dr monomita patro and she will deliver her talk on the topic that microbiome impact on human health once again i am requesting dr arindam dalal to give a brief introduction about the speakers thank you thank you dr manerji today our second speaker is dr monomita patro Dr. Patro is now an assistant professor in the subject of microbiology and cell and molecular biology at Los Rios Community College, California, USA. Dr. Patro, after completion of MSc in genetics and plant breeding from Calcutta University, she obtained a PhD degree in genetic toxicology from the Calcutta University. From 2003 to 2006, Dr. Patro was involved as CSIR research associate in the Department of Biochemistry, University of Calcutta. 
In the year of 2007, she joined as a woman scientist and principal investigator in the Department of Science and Technology, UBKV. In the year of 2008, she joined as a National Research Council Associate in US EPA, Las Vegas. There, she was involved in characterization of nanoparticles, specifically silver nanoparticles and genotoxicity of nanoparticles. In the year of 2012, she joined as postdoc associates in the Department of Chemistry, University of Nevada. Dr. Patra has published a number of research papers in various well-reputed international journals. Dr. Patra, on behalf of the Department of Physiology, Anandamohan College, I cordially welcome you. Now the platform is yours. Please carry on. Can you all see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yes, it is visible. Sorry, one more time. Can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Arindam. Uh, it is my great pleasure uh, to present uh, my uh, research related presentation uh, in the international webinar uh, arranged by the Department of Physiology, Anandamohan College. I thank uh, Principal and Dr. Pradeep Kumar Maiti, Dr. Joita Banerjee, Dr. Arindam Dalal, and other uh, organizers of the webinar. So I also thank uh, honorable guests and students who are attending in this seminar. So to begin with the seminar, I have to go back to my bachelor's days when I took botany honors and uh, I'm connected with City College and Anandamohan Mohan College in uh, many ways. So this was my first connection to City College, uh, not um, I was not a student or alumni of the college, but I uh, was uh, Professor Ghosh, actually Professor Oshim Khan Ghosh, Ghosh, was kind enough to teach me. So one day with a picture on genes file with DNA molecule and scissor, I went to him and asked about the picture. And what, she, what he explained to me, uh, that was beyond something and the knowledge can be so much extended, I had no idea. And he opened the door for me or opened that window, showed me the outer world. So with the image of the DNA and the scissor, I went uh, to study masters in genetics and plant breeding. So from there, I went to Bibi, who doesn't need any introduction in genetics department, in botany department. And uh, she taught me that to handle this scissor and the DNA molecule, you have to study and you have to have a lot. You have to learn something. So there I had all a mentor, a mentoring from her. And I'm not going to tell much uh, over here only out of many publications, two reviews I will mention. One is Mercury Toxicity in Plants, uh, published in Botanical Review. It took one year for both of us to compose. And when it was published, 
she told me with a smile, you don't have to look behind. Next, uh, another review was also a very big review on mercury, lead, and arsenic toxicity, and was published in Environmental and Experimental Botany, and was written when my father passed away, and she told me that sit down and write this review. And after sitting down for 30 minutes, I was uh, restless, and I said to her that I cannot. And then she said, if somebody can do it, you will do it. So uh, again, this paper was written, this review was written in 2000, and one time editing was done, but it was not published. And I was engaged in my CSIR uh, uh, research associateship and other research works in department of uh, biochemistry, Calcutta University. And so one day I realized it was not published. So I sent a letter to Elsevier Science and said that it is not expected from Elsevier Science. So uh, then it was published within a few months. And Didi asked me, smiling, did you argue with them? So this was hard. This is how she used to treat us. She used to train us. So from there, I said that I uh, was uh, working on the biochemistry department. And so today, whom I'm saying, Dr. Orindam Haldar. Dr. Orindam Haldar was then Orindam, and still he is Orindam to me, Chotu Bhai. <laughs> And Onu, Dr. Onu Mondol, Dr. Shudip Tapal, we all were used to work. And Orindam had a lot of energy and a lot of enthusiasm, which he still now has. And he encouraged us in many ways. So in a small lab, he used to make tea. And time to time with tea, he used to uh, engage us in a lot of works. So. I did not forget the DNA and the scissor that is still in my head, still in my brain working. And I was looking for something, but I could not. So one day Anindam pulled my hand literally and said, Didi, come to come here. Everyone is going. Why not you? So he uh, took us to a small computer room in biochemistry department where there is only one computer and weighing machine. So in that computer, like turn by turn, the students go and sit for making some arrangement for a research associateship in USA. So there he showed me that federal labs will be taking research associates. So I looked at him and said, why me? He said, yes, you can do it. So every time like you can do it and that DNA and scissor that worked in me and I applied. But in the meantime, I became a woman scientist. And I worked there for one year. And it is the amelioration of arsenic toxicity by black tea. And I left that work. And I traveled to USA to work on nanotoxicology. So he was my mentor, my advisor in USA, Dr. Kim Rogers. He was like my father. He had done what my father would have done if he was there. So under his mentorship, I worked on nanotoxicology, on carbon nanoparticles, silver nanoparticles, which are widely used for drug delivery for different industries. And those, uh, all the nanoparticles I characterized, I worked on toxicity. And also at the last phase of my uh, tenure there, I worked on the toxicity at the genotoxicity level. I did not forget Didi's mission. And uh, this paper, which was published in Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry, that paper became the cover article. And this picture shown over here was actually taken by me when I was looking at the microscope. Uh, these are the fairy shrimps. They are feeding on carbon nanoparticles and how it is affecting our ecological system, and that is shown. So that 
I were I was very much excited. I was involved in that work for a for a some for some time. I forgot about the scissor and the DNA, but time to into my mind, and then I went to the lab where I worked on uh, CDF infection. There also my mission of scissor and DNA worked out. So I'm not going to give more about that only i will i will just uh, concentrate on the first part of my presentation that is clostridium difficile infection a gut related disease which is a great problem in usa this is a hospital born disease acquired from the hospital settings 500000 people get infected every year 23000 people die per year the reason is that when people get infected, they are treated with antibiotics. It is antibiotic associated disease and more the antibiotics are taken, the good bacteria are wiped out and uh, cleaned. So more the bad bacteria, they started growing. So in the project where we try to find out a strategy to find the CDF infection. Uh, sorry, yeah. So in the project where we were working to find a strategy to fight CDF infection, we found out that the infective form of the CDF infection is the Clostridium difficile spore. And then the vegetative cells are infectious at the beginning the temporal and spatial distribution of ingested clostridium difficile spores was not clearly understood but it is our lab professor Abel santos lab that worked on it and it was worked out before i joined then we found out that there are some bile salt uh, molecules are there which actually activate the germination of Clostridium difficile spores, like chorocolate, then glycine. There are many such bile salts are there which can activate the germination. But at the same time, another bile salt analog, CAMSA, was discovered that it inhibits the spore germination that is a competent uh, inhibitor of the spore germination both in vitro and in vivo. So it was the only anti-germinant that was tested and it prevents the CDI. So we characterized then CAMSA for the in vitro stability, distribution, and cytotoxicity, which was actually the first report of using CAMSA as a molecular probe to obtain disease progression. So varying the time of cancer dosage, like when to give, and uh, the Clostridium difficile spores germinated and established uh, infection less than 10 hours, it was our finding that after ingestion of the spores, we worked on mice, that it took 10 hours to establish the infection. So here, let me tell you, whatever treatments are available till now, for treating the CDF infection is to stop the infection, that means fighting the infection. That means after the spread of the disease, then the treatment is to fight. And the treatment is what? That is antibiotics. And that makes the condition more worse. So our aim was to stop the germination of the spore. And that's it, no antibiotics. So that's why we have to find out all these timings. Spores then rapidly transited through the GI tract we found and accumulated in the colon and cecum of TAMSA treated all those mice. So spores were slowly shed over 96 hour period, we found that. And we reported that TAMSA is stable in simulated gastrointestinal environment, but will be degraded by the members of the natural microbiota found in healthy gut. 
So we are satisfied at the point and CAMSA will not be systematically, systemically available, but instead will be localized to GI tract. So after calculations, I'm not going all the big work, but there's long work to make the long story short. We found that 50 milligram per kg dose of CAMSA prevented CDI in mice without any observable toxicity. So this is the point where I worked more. Lower CAMSA doses resulted in delayed CDI. We tried with lower CAMSA doses, but it did not work out because still there are sign of disease, though less severe sign, but we didn't want to take any risk in it. So we just found out that what I was telling you that what was our objective, what was our th thought, that anti-germination effect of CAMSA is responsible, we found out, and it is proved for preventing the CDI signs. So instead of going further, instead of compromising the microbiota of CDI patients with strong antibiotics, we depend on the anti-germination therapy. Maybe we can apply to other uh, diseases also. So it is a new paradigm of CDI treatment. So maybe you are interested, what is the na name of CAMSA? My another colleague who was actually doing PhD on this, she preferred this name CAMSA. Metabenzene sulfonic acid derivative of chorocolate is actually the compound. Then this work was published in PLOS One and the Journal of Infectious Disease, and a patent was received also. And still the work is going on, but this CAMSA has not come to the market as a medicine. So everybody due to COVID-19 knows that how long it takes to make a vaccine. So also I tell my students, see, have patience, our molecule still has not come out as a medicine, though it is so important. So think of the vaccine. We have to think of so much around to bring it to the market for people. So this is our lab group, uh, Professor Santos, Abel Santos. And this is Amber, Amber and me. We had a very good relation. and. She is in uh, now associate professor in Nevada State College. So we used to work in the lab. We used to have fun hiking, uh, mountaineering. We used to do a lot of things. And uh, I really miss this lab. And in this lab, actually, I handled two other projects. So one was the uh, expression of membrane protein of lost perfringens. That was my dream project. And another one I was handed over uh, by, uh, hand, that, that is on the mechanistic pathway of bacillus anthracis, the, uh, which causes the anthrax disease. So the work over here that I, I did actually, uh, this offer did not come to me directly from Professor Santos. The offer was given to my husband, Dr. Niladri Bhomik, but he handed over that offer to me due to some visa problem. I don't know what would happen if he would have been here. Maybe that would be better. My... So after all these uh, projects and everything, after working on the CAMSA anti-germination uh, a theory, anti-germination medicine, and all these, I try to think that, can we not think in a different way? So with that thought, I have to think at the base of it. So that is the role of human genome and the role of host microbiota on the health because uh, we know that till last decade that human genome is the predominant driver for detecting the human health and the human diseases, for defining human health. 
But this idea has shifted that now today it is not the human genome, it is the other genes of the micro, uh, microbiome, those are present in our body, are also responsible for defining the human health and for detecting the disease or predicting the disease. So from 2013 to 2017, about 13,000 publications were on the human microbiota. But unapologetically, most of the people, they concentrated on the gut microbiome. This is the book, I Contain Multitudes by Adrian, I like very much. And today I have a question right now. Are you afraid of being alone? So those who are afraid of being alone, after going through my presentation, you will not be afraid anymore. So Ed Young said that gut microbiome is just like another organ because it helps us to digest the molecules of food, which we cannot. So human gut microbiota and importance, what is the importance? Because it is important for the development of the health. It is important for detecting the diseases, uh, for, for all the diseases, for health-related, health uh, gut-related, those things. Then I'm going to discuss the recent advances in understanding of gut microbes, impact of gut microbes on human health and disease, and then how to restore these gut microbes, what are the potential therapies. So human microbiota, it is a complex ecosystem. Just like our natural ecosystem, there is a big ecosystem inside our body. They all together uh, make that ecosystem, which include fungi, archaea, bacteria, and viruses. So if you look at this pie chart, you can see that about 29% of the microbiota are in the GI tract. And there are about 4,500 human gut species exist that has been identified. So there are about 500 more microbial genes as compared to human genes. So if I compare myself with you, then we are very similar, about 99.9% .9 similar with respect to human genes. But you are very different from me. Maybe we will have only 60% to 70% similarity with respect to microbial genes. So those so much microbiomes stay inside our body, but they are not harmful. They are in mutualistic relationship with us. So I like to always present this to my students to show that if this is the whole world of the microbes, we concentrate only on 0.0% and we spend all our life studying this 0.0% which is causing the disease and not on the non-infectious microorganisms. So to understand the microbiome, uh, gut microbiome, human microbiome project was taken by NIH in 2008 and National Institute of Science, uh, Health actually funded for this project and it went for 10 years in two phases. So their mission was comprehensive characterization of the human microbiome and the analysis of those microbes and their role in human health and diseases. So the communities uh, are characterized across the five major sites of the human body, nasal passage, oral cavity, skin, GI tract, and urogenital tract. 16S RNA sequencing was done with the signature molecules in the 16S RNA helped to identify 
the microbes and the meto metagenomics was included to characterize the complex relationship between the microbial communities at each body size. Now, what is metagenomics? It is the, uh, at particular site, if I think of the GI tract, it is the combination of the genes of all the microbes and the genes of the human cells in the GI tract together makes the metagenomics. So the metagenomics of the skin is there, metagenomics of oral cavity is there. So about 300 people were subjected to the test uh, between the age 18 to 40 for characterization for this big project and study. So it was found that uh, in human gut microbiome, actually, there are two dominant bacterial phyla. If you look at this luminal concentration of the bacteria, and those two dominant phyla are the bacteroidetes and the formicutes. So if first we should look at the beneficial role of the gut microbiota. First is that they are the producers, since I told you it's like an ecosystem, they produce vitamins B, vitamin K, steroid hormones, enzymes, neurotransmitters, and other chemicals. So there are many enzymes which bacteria have and we don't have. The bacteria can digest the fibers with their uh, uh, hydrolase enzyme, like glycoside, uh, glycoside hydrolase enzyme. They can break down the glycans to produce the sugar and to produce the usable sugar. They can produce the short chain fatty acids, which actually is the source of colonocytes, and it is the source of about 10 to 15 percent of adult energy. They're the decomposers, they break down our food and waste, and as I said, that produced about 10 to, 10 to 15 percent of energy of the adults. They also produce many chemicals cytokines, chemokines. They also make error uh, of our immune system. They make error the immune system that, hey, be careful, your predators are coming so that they can kill our cells. And even they can induce them to do the apoptosis, killing the cancer cells. So 70% of the immune system approximately is in the gut. There are many unknown functions which are there, which you can know and you can discover. Maybe you can claim for some more Nobel Prizes. So how do our microbiome change? First of all, when a baby is in the fetal stage inside mother's womb, the baby is in a sterile condition. Because of this, we have seen in COVID-19 pandemic that mother is infected, but the child is not infected. The child is secured inside the womb. So, but it started from the birth time, whether it is a natural or C-section, that the baby acquires the microbiome from mother by inhaling, by swallowing, and through urogenital tract. And gradually with diet, this diversity, microbial diversity increases. And gradually, gradually, it increases over years. And at a time, adult stage, it becomes constant. So as our diet changes, as I said, that microbiome change, and also it changes with the environment, like medical conditions, different treatments with antibiotics, then uh, non-antibiotics, proton pump inhibitors, environmental chemicals, all the chemicals that we, those we use for cleaning, insecticide, pesticide, uh, all kinds of 
perfumes, cosmetics, there are many more you can think of. Space. So if you look at this picture, it's horrible. And this dog will let you come and will do this. So think of how we are exposed to different kinds of microbiome and how microbiome change over years. Many more factors you can think of and you can investigate. So I have a question for you. Which do you think is more similar to your microbiome? Is it your classmate, your colleague, or your parents? Most probably now parents, uh, you are getting close more if you do not spend more time with your parents. So I'm just joking. You can just think of it like uh, you spend your time, most of the time with your colleague in lab or college very closely. So your microbiome is affected. You can explain in many ways. So coming to the diseases, why these diseases de develop? Though we have so much beneficial role of microbiomes, it developed due to the dysregulation, a dysregulated gut microbiome, which is called dysbiosis. And it leads to many diseases, starting from type 1, inflammatory bowel disease, which we, in short, we say IBD, then uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, then atherosclerosis, obesity, carcinogenesis, pulmonary disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and so on. So uh, many more are there. Uh, recently, I came across that pancreatic carcinoma is induced by fungus, malassezia species. In Nature 2019, I saw that. So the major mechanisms that involved uh, in the crosstalk between the microbes and the host and that develop the metabolic disorders is explained by a good picture over here. So the left part of the picture is about the healthy situation of the gut and the right part is about the disease where the metabolic disorders are there in the healthy gut. So if you look at this picture, you can see that uh, the mucus layer is thick, intact. There is a production of short chain fatty acids like propionate, butyrate are there in good amount. The lymphocytes are there. Antimicrobial signals are well maintained. Energy intake is good and the blood glucose level is also regulated, maintained. Gut peptides are also produced in good amount. But when there is a metabolic disorder, we see first, look at this light blue colored mucus layer has been corroded, it has reduced. And since it has reduced, you can see there are lots of disorders appearing because the pathogens are trying to grow. And since the short chain fatty acids like butyrate is not produced, butyrate is also uh, responsible for maintaining the anaerobic condition of the gut. So since it is not produced in right amount, the aerobic condition increases. And as the aerobic condition or oxygen is more available, then members of Enterococcusi that are, sorry, Enterobacteriaceae, they are growing over here more and producing uh, gut-related diseases. Antimicrobial signal is missing. Gut peptides are not produced in th that way. So uh, gut uh, brain uh, regulation is affected. Uh, we can see the inflammation, we see the uh, energy intake, blood glucose level, these are all affected and resulting in metabolic endotoxemia due to the production of lots of endotoxins. So gut microbes can also be used as cancer diagnostics. If you see in this graph, then you can see that uh, Different short chain fatty acids are there and their percentage are there in relation to healthy and the 
colorectal cancer patient is given. The dark one is from the colorectal cancer patient and the lighter one is from the healthy patient. And for the butyric acid, you can see that there is a significant difference between the healthy and the colorectal patient. So um, as I told you earlier also that butyric actually is the main source of human colonocyte energy and can also induce apoptosis of colon cancer. So it explains uh, that why that graph is like that. So variations in related proportions of bacteria reproduced short chain fatty acids in stool is used to identify cancer. And also we see that the level of pharmacutes is also reduced uh, in case of colorectal cancer patient. So there are some common microbial signatures in chronic illness. Uh, we see that the microbial diversity gets reduced in case of chronic illness and the density as well as richness. The most affected groups are bacteroides and the foreign bacterium, anaerococcus, and all of them. Also, the microbes with anti-inflammatory properties like pharmacutes, they also get uh, down. Their population is also reduced. Naturally, when the good bacteria are reduced, the pathogenic microbes increased. Then the microbial population significantly changes with diet. So if there is a change in diet, we can see what happens. High carbohydrate diets promote the growth of Clostridium clusters and other bacteria we can see at the expense of bacteroidetes. High diets promote bile tolerant genera, then high protein diets favors for Rosberia and other bacteria, you can see that. So what are the interventions? What are the range of interventions that can modulate the microbiome? There are clinical interventions like fecal microbiota transfer from the healthy patients, antibiotics, probiotics, pharmabiotics, impact of non-antibiotic drugs on the microbiome. So how they modulate the microbiome, they modulate the relative distribution of microbial species or strains throughout the gut. They modulate the number of bacteria. The metabolic activity can be modulated. Then there are interactions with the host as well, and also the virulence, bacterial antigens, and the biofilms. And also there is a lifestyle modification, which I'm most interested in, the nutritional intervention and the modification both in short term and long term. So under this, I put the prebiotics and probiotics, caloric restrictions, exercise, and other lifestyle factors. I will stay on prebiotics and probiotics, how they are naturally related to our system so diet the fiber rich less fat simple sugar diet is preferred so if i talk about the prebiotics to know that it is a substrate which is selectively used by the microbi microbiomes for health benefits for giving the good health and you can see the pictures of the potential uh, prebiotics so it benefits the IBS, that is inter intestinal irritable bowel syndrome and gastrointestinal effects also. It helps in A1C regulation, calcium homeostasis, weight loss, immunological, of course, enhancing the antibody response to vaccines, for example, promoting anti-inflammatory uh, cytokine profiles, neurological and benefits in terms of mood and cognition, and also cardiovascular improve in the lipid profiles. 
So in this regard, I would like to uh, include curcumin, anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer activity property. It has, it reduces the bi biofilm development and the quorum sensing virulence factors, and it has antibacterial effect. So we can work on neem. Probably many, many people have worked. If you remember this liquid, the morning mist, I don't know how, how many of you were affected in childhood by this drink. Affected means every Sunday, I had to drink a cup of that because on Saturday night, my mother used to actually uh, immerse the sticks of Suecia Chirota, Chirota Jol in glass. And next morning, we have to drink a cup of that. It was, every Sunday was horrible for us. This is a range of prebiotics I've given over here. Mostly, I think you can identify. This is our favorite uh, Malabar spinach, Puishak. This is about Centella Asiatica. This is Jukti full. I don't find it here. I look for it when I'll go back to India, I'll have it. This is Dheki Shak, which is a fern. This is Marsilia, Shushni Shak. This is also a fern. So all these are the source of prebiotics. So if I go to probiotics, probiotics are the direct administration of the live bacteria inside the host. And you can see the bacteria, their names over here, lactobacillus, streptococcus. So when we go to a market to buy yogurt, we look for this level and we look how many bacteria, live bacteria culture are inside the yogurt. Many are there. If many more are there, then the cost of that yogurt is high. Then there are many more other uh, food is there, which are source of good probiotics, like kimchi, kefir drink, which is very similar to our uh, buttermilk. This is um, the cheese. So there are many uh, research papers, many findings about the probiotics, but the consistent benefits are the prevention of treatment of diarrhea in children, antibiotic associated diarrhea, and necrotizing enterocolitis, IBS, and IBD. So when I am talking about the diet, I should talk about fasting, uh, which is a great challenge in dietary study. And it is common in all culture and all religions. Fasting results in beneficial effects. It's a positive effect on intestinal inflammation definitely weight loss and beneficial metabolic impacts. So I remember my mother used to say, khe ke morena, na khe ke morena, khe more. So this is that. So interesting facts are over here, a few. Uh, Azobelia uh, is a kind of a bacteria that lives on seaweed. And this seaweed is used by the Japanese to make their food sushi and nori. So a green, uh, it, it is a leaf-like structure they make. So Japanese is the only population who can digest that seaweed. No other population can do that. Slowly, we are doing that. The reason is that for generations after generations, they are making food with the seaweed, and they are ingesting this bacteria, Zobelia, which is now inside their gut and they know how to do the digestion of that. So American population and many other uh, countries, uh, different uh, nations, they cannot do that. This is sushi, uh, Japanese food. Interesting. Another finding about the koala bears. So one koala bear, one wild type of koala bear, they feed on the eucalyptus viminalis and another koala type bears, they actually feed on obliqua. So viminalis cannot, the koala bear, which feed on the viminalis species, cannot actually digest the obliqua. So the scientists did what? Took the fecal, uh, they did the fecal transplantation from the koala bear feeding on obliqua to, him, to the koala bear who feed on this. And later on, it was found that the wild koala bears can digest the obliqua. 
recent another paper came that is about the gut microbiota and their uh, reciprocal uh, communication and regulation with the immune cells that came in nature in March 2020. So remember, most microbiomes are our friends. Another good example is this paper where the mice which are having the milk allergy, there, the, those mice were treated with the microbes from the babies who don't have the milk allergy, healthy babies. And later on, it was found that the mice are cured and they don't have any more milk allergy. The recent another paper which came out this week, which is about uh, that they have done mathematically a model and they got a term gut microbiome health index. And they are calculating that index, which is biologically interpretable to predict the likelihood of having disease independent of clinical diagnosis. So to review, Understanding the human microbiome is just like a tip of an iceberg. The maximum part of it, 75%, is under the ocean, and we can see only this part. So you can keep a log of what you are eating, breakfast, lunch, dinner. You can discuss among yourself and see what is the impact of your diet. You can discuss with your friends, discuss with your family members. So. Um, I want to dedicate my lecture, uh, today's lecture, to my brother, uh, Panchajan Nupatra. Uh, he would have been here if, uh, if he would have got the chance. So uh, I would like to tell you that um, I worked in this summer on, uh, the, on making the repository of uh, open stacks material that means students can have free textbooks so i uh, worked with a grant uh, in lost your district to develop the two repositories one on cell and molecular biology and one on microbiology due to covid 19 it will come out late but you can see it online there are few books which you can read but it will come with more uh, I worked so much hard. You can see that. Um, and you don't have to buy the books. So uh, the costly books are sometimes very difficult for students to buy. So I like to, um, maybe later I will uh, communicate this to Ananda Mohan College. You can look for that book. And yes, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your wonderful talk. And uh, as we are lacking our time, so we are not attending any questions at, the, at present. We will, if the speakers are available, we will present the questions uh, at the end of the session. Now I am moving to the our next speaker. The next speaker of today's session is Dr. Niladri Bhoumi. The topic of his presentation is Human Health Assessment toxicological data evaluation for product registration. Now, again, I would like to request Dr. Arindam Dalal to introduce Dr. Tomi. Again, thank you, Dr. Banerjee. Today, our third speaker is Dr. Neelachi Bhoumik. Dr. Bhoumik at present, an associate toxicologist, human health assessment branch, Department of Pesticides Regulation, Excuse California. Me, Dr. I can't hear you. Okay. Dr. Bhoumi, at present as Associate Toxicologist, Human Health Assessment Branch, Department of Pesticides Regulation, California, U.S. Dr. Bhoumi, after completion his MSc degree in Genetics and Plant Breeding from Benares Hindu University, he obtained his PhD degree in Genetics and Plant Breeding from Calcutta University. From 2002 to 2007, he was an assistant professor, Department of Genetics and Plant Breeding, UVKB. In the year of 2008, he joined as an adjunct instructor in the Department of Physic and Physical and Life Sciences, Las Vegas. From 2013 to 2018, he remained as an adjunct instructor, College of Sardar Nevada. 
He also a visiting assistant professor at Department of Chemistry, Mainland, USA. For his teaching experience, he received the prestigious Teacher Recognition Award to the University of Nevada for two consecutive years, 2018 and 2019. Dr. Homik is an author and co-author of about 25 peer-reviewed research articles, including books, book chapters in well-recognized national and international journals. Dr. Homik, on behalf of Department of Physiology, Ananda Moon College, I cordially welcome you. Now the platform is yours. Please carry on. Just a minute, I'm sharing the screen. Can you see my presentation? Hello, can you see my presentation? Yes, uh, there are some uh, files. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You just stop. Yes, sorry. You can see the presentation, right? No, uh, uh, first open it and then uh, and then we can see it. Actually, it is uh, a number of uh, files are there. First open it and then uh, go to the present screen. No, I opened it already. But it is not showing. Re then you can redo it. Uh, Let me redo it. Yeah. Yes. I think. Yeah, I, I think it will work now. Can you see now? Yes, yes, yes it's visible. OK, so you can see the presentation and you can hear me, right? Yes, yes. OK, thank you, Dr. Dalal, for the nice presentation. And thank you, Anandamon College, for inviting me to present uh, before you briefly what we do as a state regulatory agency in the state of California uh, in USA. And, and thank you, uh, the chair, Professor Maiti, and the entire team, basically, uh, for doing the wonderful organization of this international webinar. I was fortunate to be speaking before you. Uh, and I can, I can see from the last two days, there were a number of uh, speakers who were experts in the field of physiology uh, talking before you all, especially if I will tell the students that it's, it's a very good thing that you're listening to so many great speakers and, and experts and teachers in your field uh, who delivered all, the, all those nice informations to you. So, uh, to start with, uh, I, I made a little uh, modification to the title. As you can see, uh, it's uh, the human health assessment part is missing. So toxicological data evaluation, and, and it's there specifically for pesticide product registration. And I work with the human health assessment branch uh, with the Department of Pesticide Regulation in, in the capital of California, Sacramento. 
begin with, uh, I go for, go through this disclaimer that uh, the views expressed uh, are not necessarily uh, uh, represent the California DPR, or Department of Pesticide Regulation, or California Environmental Protection Protection Agency, or, or the state of California. And the presenter has no financial disclosures. So to start with, uh, let me begin with uh, one thing, like from the last two days, from the last three days, basically, you are hearing about uh, the experimental works and, and other things, and mostly experimental results and, and how they were conducted and interpretations and so on. So my talk will be a little different and I will be mainly focusing on what we do to regulate and protect the environment and basically by regulating uh, pesticides use and, and, and better and more practical use of pesticides pesticides, excuse me. So uh, quick background, uh, I did my bachelor's and, and master's in, I'm very fortunate to do in Benaras Hindu University in the in the city of Varanasi. And, and from then, uh, my master's as Dr. Dalal mentioned, it was in genetics and plant breeding. And then I was again lucky to be, to join uh, the cytology lab a very renowned cytology lab of, of Sharma and Sharma. And I was uh, directly under supervision of Archana Sharma. We call him our DD. And, and then Professor Own Sharma also. We learned uh, many things, uh, karyotyping, how to, how to uh, come up with a good chromosome plate, how to study toxicity of, of in, the, in, the, in, in the chromosomal levels and in the DNA levels. Uh, but also, I should mention here, like as the students are here, uh, when you are doing bachelor's, master's, or PhDs, this is the time you learn uh, not only the academic part, but you learn, learn from your, your workers, colleagues, and especially your mentors. Uh, and, and the things okay. I learned is the pres is the is how you attack a, a research problem how you design a research uh, a, a program and how you go through the procedure, the methods and so on, and how you interpret. We even learn from them how to talk in a public uh, conference or seminar and so on. So that was a, a big thing for me personally. And as you know, both of them were Padma Bhushan awardees and, and, and they were, stalwarts in the field of chromosome uh, and, and cell research. And, and their book is regarded as the Bible of, of cytology. Uh, moving on, from there I moved to, I got a job and I moved to Kuchbihar uh, on the northern part of West Bengal. And I joined uh, an university which is newly formed, Uttar Bango Krishi Vishwavitalai. And I was primarily involved with teaching genetics and plant breeding in the Department of Genetics and Plant Breeding. And I was also assigned a, uh, as a research coordinator of an AICRP project on, on turmeric and allied spices. And as you can see here, the, the front building of the university and on the right, you can see uh, the it's a field trial of the variety we developed, uh, our breeder developed uh, during my, my time when I was there. And, and this was uh, a, a quite successful variety of turmeric, uh, which is being used in the northern part of West Bengal. So from there, this is uh, till 2007, I was there. And then I moved to Vegas, a big jump. And, and in December of 2007, I moved to Las Vegas. Uh, to join my family, as you were hearing my wife talking just before me, uh, she was uh, she came alone with uh, our daughter, uh, 18 months old probably, and so I thought and I was lucky and fortunate to to join them, and I joined the University of Nevada Las Vegas as the visiting faculty, and I, in the department of chemistry. That's another funny thing that as a student of genetics and plant breeding, I was, I was 
doing teaching and research in Department of Chemistry, definitely in the biochemistry field. And, and later on, I also started teaching in, in some colleges and even high schools. And as you can see here, uh, on the extreme left, a uh, couple of people helped me, and, and that's why I put those pictures here. Uh, Professor Gary, Ronald Gary from uh, biochemistry uh, section of the chemistry department. And he, he was not only a great teacher, a great researcher, but he helped me uh, with getting used to teaching in US uh, university and so on. And then uh, on, the, on the picture uh, second from the right is another Baumic, Professor Baumic, uh, the students used to call senior Baumic. He was an organic chemist uh, and a stalwart in his field. And, and primarily uh, dealing uh, with uh, his, his continuing his research, dealing with synthesis of organic compounds and, and a very prominent researcher in the field of organic uh, chemistry. And, and he helped me a lot uh, during my days at UNLV. And uh, you can see that the fun uh, and, and the, the gift is not the award I, I showed here, the gift for a teacher basically is when uh, the students uh, recognize you, the, lo they love you as a teacher. They, 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 have, they have done that to me. I was lucky enough to get those love and affection from students uh, from all the institutions. And anyway, so my teaching responsibility in those colleges and in the university was uh, basically chemistry and, and uh, higher level biochemistry. And so I, it was not fun uh, to read Leninger and Steyer in a couple of months. And then uh, definitely human ge genetics. And my uh, courses I was assigned are mostly undergrad and grad, which include master's and PhD uh, classes. And then, uh, so moving on, uh, then I joined the California Department of Pesticide Regulation. And before I go into what we do in, in, in our institution, uh, let me talk about a little bit uh, an introduction maybe because of, of the, the, the variability maybe in the audience uh, of the pesticide exposure and risk. Now, uh, we deal primarily with these two parameters of pesticide application. And, and, and so pesticides, uh, basically uh, the application of pesticides started with uh, um, metals, non-metals like sulfur, arsenical compounds, copper compounds, and so on. And then it moves to uh, chlorinated hydrocarbons, organophosphates, uh, neonicotinoids, and, and rest. And, and, and so, Basically, at the early 20th century uh, and to till the, the, the later part of 20th century, there was uh, not much of awareness or knowledge about uh, the, the toxicity uh, from the exposure to pesticides. And I, I want to present uh, a few pictures from here. Like this is the agent orange which includes uh, a mixture of 2,4-D, 2,4-5-T, but the most uh, worst part is that it contains a dioxin, which is a human carcinogen, uh, can cause cancer. And it has also, it can cause birth defects and, and, and type two diabetes and, and different types of other ailments also. And so this is uh, used wi in uh, widespread during the Vietnam War. And then, uh, no toxicological talk basically can, can be complete without talking about DDT, uh, dichloro, diphenyl, trichloroethane. And, and you can see here the picture is that uh, the exposure of DDT, it's a spray going on and the exposure to the bystanders and so on. And, and then seniors in this audience probably will recognize the picture on the right. Uh, we used to have it have in our households, uh, and then those are primarily used to to kill mosquitoes and and to reduce the the risk of malarial disease. And it's still being used 
in, in India and, and some African countries. Now, there were many acts uh, in, in, in reference to USA, uh, many acts was, uh, were, were established and many institutions were, uh, were uh, basically came up. Uh, and but most of these acts uh, and the the regulations uh, are, are were primarily dealing with uh, California. Uh, sorry, not California. Dealing with uh, product quality, and there was less awareness about the the risk uh, from the exposure to this uh, the health risk from the exposure to the pesticides, uh, and a big paradigm shift shift came uh, to me uh, through the inter uh, to the publication of the silent spring by rachel carlson and and then in 1970 uh, us epa was was established us environmental protection agency and and then the cdfa the california department of food and agriculture was established and which uh, in 72, 1972, which tried to monitor uh, pesticide use uh, and even adjuvants, uh, and that, that was the first in the country. And then in, in 1991, uh, the California Department of Pesticide Regulation was, was formed. Now, I will go into that, but before that, uh, the exposure risks are, are, are everywhere from different sources. And one of the example I'm showing here is the drift uh, due to aerial spray of, of pesticides. As I was mentioning, uh, in 1991, the California Environmental Protection Agency, or California EPA, was formed along with the department and under which uh, the Department of Pesticide Regulation was, was established. And, and this uh, provided a complete uh, framework or an institution for regulation of pesticide use, uh, hazard assessment, exposure assessment, and so on. And this is a group picture taken last year uh, before the pandemic. And test your eyes. Uh, let me know when you can find me in that picture. Okay, so by the way, the DPR's uh, mission was to protect, very simple, protect the human health and the environment. Uh, by regulating a couple of things, pesticide cell and pesticide use, and also by fostering uh, reduced risk pest management in the form of uh, biopesticides and botanicals and so on, IPA and, and many other things. Now, Department of Pesticide Regulation has uh, three branches, has three, sorry, divisions, pesticide program division, uh, then Office of Tech Services and Administrative Services Division. Now, under the Pesticide Program Divisions, uh, we are, are, are located in the Human Health Assessment Branch uh, uh, and where we deal with the basically assessment of the, uh, the, of the, ex, of the exposure, uh, the risk, and, and the toxic, toxicity of pesticides. Uh, formulations and and also the active ingredients of pesticides. Then we have the registration branch, which deals with the uh, the registrants who are submitting their their new regis registration documents, and and so the the registrants have to submit. The companies have to submit to and and when they submit to DPR, the the first it goes to the registration branch. Then you have the worker health and safety branch, which deals with the safety of the workers, like the applicators, loaders of the pesticides, and, and even bystanders. And then you have the pesticide evaluation branch. This is a new branch, which is uh, primarily uh, evaluate the pesticide toxicity uh, and, and provide uh, grants for, for safer pesticide uh, techniques for development of safer pesticide techniques and methods. Then you have the enforcement branch, which deals with the enforcement of, the, of both the federal and the state uh, laws and regulations. And, and then it, it also deals with the, uh, collects the pesticide use data in the whole state of California. 
And it also, very importantly, also monitors the pesticide residue, uh, especially uh, from uh, illegal pesticides. And, and then uh, the next uh, branch included in DPR is the enforcement branch, uh, which deals with uh, the, sorry, I, I, I already mentioned about the enforcement branch. So moving on, the monitoring branch, it monitors the air quality, the surface water and the groundwater quality, and, and also the soil quality and, and impact of pesticides on them. And then we have then another new branch, uh, uh, the IPM branch, which uh, deals with uh, development of IPM strategies and, and planning and, and implementation of those programs, including in, in schools and daycares. And then uh, finally, we have the pest management and licensing branch, which uh, deals with, as, as the name suggests, uh, management of pesticides. They monitor uh, safer and practical use of pesticides. They also uh, conduct exams and provides licenses for commercial people who, uh, who sell commercially the pesticides or who provide consultation about pesticides. And also, um, so that's what they primarily do uh, among many other things. And, and so moving on, so just a quick summary of this slide. So we are in the human health assessment branch. And, and, and before we go into the detail of what we do actually in the human health assessment branch and in, the, in particular in our section, uh, uh, just for, for the students especially, uh, this is how we define pesticides. Any substance, a single substance or a mixture of sus substances, uh, intended, intended for either preventing, destroying, even repelling or mitigating any pest. And those pests can be insects, rodents, nematodes, fungus, weeds, like herbs, and other forms of terrestrial or aquatic plant, or animal life, and microbes, including viruses, bacteria, but except the microbes which are present on or in living organisms, including us. And you had a, you heard about the, the microbiome uh, in, in the previous talk. So those are, are not pests. You already understood from that talk, basically, because they're beneficial. So the, and, and that, Definition includes any substance uh, or mixture of substance in that intended for use as a plant regulator, defoliant, or, or desiccant. So that, that it's not only about paste, but uh, pesticides includes plant regulators, desiccants, and, and defoliants. Now, the categories of pesticides, uh, the, the submissions we get are for majority of them uh, are for conventional pesticides, which are mostly chemical pesticides. And then we see biochemical and microbial pesticides and biopesticides included. And this is a picture I took uh, from my Amant field trip uh, last year. And you can see this white one is the mating disruptor pheromones used here to disrupt the mating behavior of uh, orange ringworm, which is a major pest in almond farming. And then you have the antimicrobial pesticides. Uh, there's a lot of talk going on with this right now. Uh, all of the disinfectants we use are antimicrobial uh, pesticides, which, are, which we are using now, especially in this pandemic era. Now, it also includes uh, spray adjuvants, and, and, and California needs uh, adjuvants to be registered also. So we review the toxicity of, of adjuvants also. So basically adjuvants are the, the added material, additional material added to the, the pesticide or added to the active ingredient of the formulation, uh, which increases the efficacy of the pesticide as a whole. 
and it can be a buffering agent which can um, balance the pH, it can be oil, it can be a, a, a solubilizing material which can make more nonpolar organic materials uh, to, to, to get soluble and so on. And, and California, by the way, the fun fact here is that California is the first state uh, to start registration of, of the adjuvants. And, and as I mentioned in the definition, uh, we get uh, submissions from plant growth regulators also. Now, in the health, human health assessment branch, we have basically uh, the data review section and where I am working. And, and it includes two sections, uh, which are active or subsections, you can say, uh, the active ingredient section and the product formulation section. And as the name suggests, you can see like we, uh, this section deals with active ingredients, just the active ingredients. Uh, and and this, uh, the other section where I work mostly is with product formulation section. But both of these sections are very interconnected and we discuss uh, if anything like requires to be discussed uh, with the other section and so on. And we, we also seek opinions uh, from the experts from the other sections also. And as you can see, these are the pictures of some of them are, are product, uh, products, the ultimate products, and some of those like the Clorox here. And, and, and some of these are, are basically active ingredients. So yeah, for students, again, uh, the active ingredients like just for example, like if you have a disinfecting wipes, uh, we are using it right now a lot. So if it is made up of ethanol, uh, the ethanol is the active ingredient and the product will be whatever the brand name is. Now to review the toxicity of those, uh, either the active ingredients or the products, uh, the pesticide formulations, uh, we primarily follow uh, two guidelines. Uh, one uh, given by U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and the other one uh, given by OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. So they have given a bunch of uh, uh, standard protocols and routine procedures which needs to be followed, and and we follow uh, those whether the registrants or whether the applicants have have followed those guidelines uh, or not. The other two things which we keep in mind, the first one is the, the Bus Defect Prevention Act, uh, which is also known as Senate Bill 19, uh, 950. And this is basically, it requires us to provide or submit chronic health studies uh, whenever there is a new active ingredient. So that is uh, the other name for that is Birth Defect Prevention Act. And so it's a must that if, if you're trying to register a new active ingredient, uh, there should be uh, chronic studies uh, to support uh, the registration of that particular active ingredient. And the second one is the Assembly Bill uh, 1011, uh, which, which allows us to use the previous volumes or the previous studies and and let me give you an example. Like if you have if you, if you if I got an an product with uh, with an ethyl alcohol or ethanol concentration of seventy percent, um, I can look into my database, and you can see it's a huge database uh, with a lot of uh, data volumes and and a lot of toxicity studies, and I can look into those data volume and find something which is similar. Uh, not less in concentration than the new applicant uh, material, but uh, it's fine if it's more than that. So if suppose uh, someone uh, submitted a 70% ethanol uh, product, I will look for something, uh, a product which is 70% or more, and I can bridge that data. And, and, and I, based on that previous study, I can use the toxicity categories and, and in that way, uh, it saves time for the registrant, it's a money for them, and it saves, uh, it definitely uh, saves um, 
sacrificing animals also, because most of the studies we do, uh, the registrants do are in vivo uh, studies on animals. So types of data, uh, the product formulation section uh, where I work for, uh, we, we concentrate on acute studies. Acute studies are basically studies which are completed within 21 days. And it's, it's popularly called six pack. And, and, and the first three you see here, the oral, dermal, and inhalation are systemic studies, and normally done in, in rodent species. And then you have the primary eye irritation study and the dermal irritation study, uh, which are done, done normally in non-rodent species uh, like guinea pigs. And then uh, the, the sixth of the six pack is the dermal sensitization or skin sensitization study, uh, which can be done in rodent or non-rodent species. So, so these are the, the, the six ter acute studies uh, which, which we look for, or we look for the toxicity uh, based on these six studies of the product uh, submitted to us. Now, the active ingredient sec section, uh, as, as we, have we, we have covered that, it, it deals with the SB950. And so it, there has to be uh, not only acute studies, those these studies, but it will additionally have uh, subchronic studies, which are normally completed within 90 days, three months, and chronic studies, which can go up to uh, two years, one to two years. So it's, it's, this is more uh, like uh, overall uh, evaluation of toxicity before an, an active ingredient can be registered uh, in the state of California. <clears throat> This is a, an example. You don't have to memorize it, but just to give you an, 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 uh, how we assess the, the toxicity. And this is again uh, the, in the guidelines uh, given by uh, US EPA. So on the on the left and the, the first column, you see all the tests there, and then the the second to the, to the columns afterwards, you see the categories. And if I take an example, let's say um, the first one, oral study, acute oral study, the LD50 uh, here is measured. LD50 is the concentration which causes 50% death of the test animals. And so if, if it is less than 50 milligram per kg or, or, or just equal to 50 milligram per kg, we categorize it as category one. And it's, it's the, the most severe. Uh, category in terms of hazards or toxicity. And then uh, I'm not reading all of these, but you can see uh, the, the, the ranges for each of the categories. And, and similarly for inhalation, we do it in milligram per liter uh, of air. And, and that's called LC50, which is again, the lethal concentration, which causes 50% death of the animals. And now the primary eye and primary skin, a uh, little different. And here we look for uh, corrosiveness of the chemical. And if it is corrosive, uh, then we go for category one. Or even if it's not corrosive, but the, the irritations are, are lasting for more than 21 days. I mentioned you before, the acute studies are, are, are completed in 21 days. So if it is continuing on 21 and, and even more number of days, then it's it's category one. And then you see similarly, it's between eight to 21 days, irritation clearing, then it's category two and so on. If it is just less than 24 hours, minimum effect, uh, it's category four, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, same thing with the skin irritation. It, 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 we classify them as corrosive, the first column, category one and non-corrosive which can and differ in degree of, of the uh, impact. And the, the sixth study, again, is the dermal sensitization, where we just provide a qualitative estimate, whether it's a positive sensitizer, uh, like we'll provide itching and, and maybe blisters and so on, or is it a negative sensitizer? Now, at product level, uh, those who read product labels. These are very important points to note. And many of my 
friends uh, from my college days, university days are probably watching this and they must be getting excited with this because they deal with these every day. And, and so there are a lot of information in a product level to see. The first one, I will say the signal words, and that uh, includes either danger, warning, caution, and so on. Then you have the precautionary statements along with the first states uh, and, and also directions for use. Uh, if it is uh, like like how much ounces uh, it will be used uh, diluted with how much water and so on and and then uh, it will include an epa registration number and uh, it will also have a, a proper storage uh, statement and and disposal when when the use is done and also as you can see here uh, it also will have the active ingredient composition so, so it will include the precautionary statements uh, first aid statements and also the ppe or the personal protection equipment especially for applicators or loaders who are, who are applying the pesticide or that particular pesticide and for agricultural products uh, because we not only deal with agricultural products we deal with all kinds of products and, and we are dealing with uh, products like disinfectants and other things. But if we come across agricultural products like a weedicide, herbicide, insecticide, and so on, uh, we uh, we have to, uh, the registrant have to provide a restricted entry interval, which is basically the interval after the application, uh, uh, like that the applicator or the user or nobody can basically can enter that field for that period of time so that's called rei so now this is i'm telling you because we have to interpret the acute toxicity categories or the hazard designations the category one two three four and based on that uh, we will figure out whether the signal word are the precautionary statements and even the first aid statements are PPE uh, uh, specifications are appropriate for that pesticide formulation or not. So that's where we need to evaluate, uh, going back, we need to evaluate these categories correctly and appropriately because this will basically indicate what should be the language in the in the product label but going back so we look for those uh, and most of the times uh, it's it's okay but some um, many other times we see the signal word is either not correct or precautionary statements and we recommend them to amend them and and, and they resubmit those documents again and as I mentioned, for agricultural products, uh, we look for the REI also. And uh, how we calculate the REI? The REI is not calculated based on the on the active ingredient present, the composition uh, of the active ingredient present in that formulation, but it's it's the uh, we deal with the technical grade active ingredient. So, for example, if you, if I have a product which is sixty percent ethanol or ethyl alcohol. Uh, I will look for these studies, acute dermal, primary eye, and primary dermal studies uh, for the technical grade of that active ingredient, which in this case is ethanol. So the uh, technical grade means it's, it's almost pure or pure, 95%, 99%. So what is the category for that technical grade? We will look into that. And based on that, we will assign the REI. So now for a couple of slides, or maybe three slides, I will give you a few examples for the students to understand it uh, in, in a more sim simple language. So this, this is the first column you see is the, sorry, the first heading you see is for oral toxicity, acute oral toxicity. Now a product has a category one, Just this is just an example. Now the signal word has to be, in that case, danger, poison, and with the skull and crossbones, that's required and uh, the precautionary statement which will go in 
into that product level will should include this this information and there's not much room for modification of the in this information like fatal if swallowed that has to be there that the product formulation is category one for acute oral toxicity and same thing uh, the next one is the acute inhalation is, is is again category one and if if we think that it's a category one um, hazard for that product then the signal word should include this and the statement sh should be uh, should follow this particular statements that's about the precautionary statements now giving an example of first if statements now if this is a category one if we take this thing now this is fine this is the precautionary statement in that it should in include but what should be the first aid statement the first aid statement for the oral toxicity if the categories are uh, one two or even three these information should be included in the first aid statement and similarly i'm giving you another example of because we are dealing with acute inhalation also so if it is inhalation toxicity category one these statements needs to be there move person to fresh air call 911 and call a poison control center, center or doctor for further treatment advice. So these are a few examples, and these statements will change uh, based on the toxicity categories. This is an example of the PPE uh, information needed for, a, uh, for the particular toxicity category. So if it is category one, it's basically coverall uh, with socks. Uh, it's, uh, this is dermal irritation or skin irritation potential. And then chemical resistant footwear, waterproof or chemical resistant gloves. And then uh, respiratory, basically masks in 95. And uh, eye irritation, if they have eye irritation potential of category one, uh, they need to wear goggles and so on. So that things. Uh, uh, does not change much with category two, a little flexibility with category three in terms of inhalation toxicity. And, and then for category four, uh, there's no recommendation basically, but it's, it's, uh, there's no requirement basically, but it's highly recommended that long sleeve shirt and long pants uh, as, as the PPA. One more example, uh, if it's an agricultural product, uh, uh, how we calculate the REI. So if the most severe toxicity category is three or four, we, uh, we assign the REI of 12 hours. What it means is that if all the six pack are either three or four, let's say all of them are four, for example, uh, then the REI will be 12 hours. That means once it is applied, there has to be an interval of 12 hours after which the applicant or, or person who wants to do uh, the work in the field, in that particular field, uh, they have to provide that 12 hour interval. Now, if the, the most severe tox category is two, we go with the conservative approach here. So if, if you have a bunch of two, uh, a bunch of threes and fours, but only one of them is two, even the REI will be 24 hours. And if one or more is one category, toxicity category one, then the REI is 48 hours. And if, if, if uh, the product is an organophosphate compound or a choline esteris inhibitor, then the REI is normally three days or 72 hours. And this is typically where the product, uh, where in the product level, you will see the, uh, the, that information. It's under agricultural use requirements. There are many things which will be written here, uh, but this is the information you're looking for, REI of 12 hours. And the applicators, or loaders, or anyone working in that field has to follow that order. And if they have to go within that 12 hours the interval, they have to follow this PPE requirements. And only then they can go into that particular field before the end of 12 hours or for 24 or whatever the REI is. 
So we deal with, to summarize, basically deal with pesticide formulations, not just active ingredients. And we primary process, the major process we do deal with is the, is the evaluation of the toxicity, acute toxicity uh, in the form of six, pa six pack. And sometimes we get the actual studies. Sometimes we bridge it, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, due to the AB 1011 bill, uh, we can now bridge it with pre-existing data. And sometimes we have to use data from open literature, maybe journal article or so on. So this is uh, where I, I feel basically where you need the expertise and experience of a toxicologist to properly evaluate uh, the acute toxicity of a product. And, and uh, the final outcome will be the establishment of toxicity categories, which ranges from category one to four. You already uh, know about that. And then also identification acute hazards, especially if it is uh, if the product formulation, one of the six, one or more of the six acute studies uh, indicate that it's a category one toxicity, then, uh, then that has to be uh, explained properly. And then basically because to determine the acceptability or appropriateness of the proposed label. And in this process, as we have seen in, in the, the bridge branches I mentioned, uh, we frequently interact with the, especially with the registration branch uh, and, and discussion about changes in the level, like we are not happy with the, with the information and, and we don't directly talk with the registrant. Uh, we talk with the registration branch specialist and, and they convey our information to them. And, and we sometimes we need their help uh, to find out the data on file with DPR. And, and especially if those files we require are old files. And, and also uh, in, in, in this procedure of bridging of data uh, from the test article to the subject product. Uh, now, in addition to product formulation section, as I mentioned before, uh, we do data review for active ingredients. Now, those requires the, the basically the acute studies, as you can see here, but it also requires the subchronic studies for all of those, uh, like the mentioned in the six pack, basically acute orals, like subchronic oral, subchronic dermal, subchronic inhalation, and also chronic studies, uh, which can go more than a year. But it also deals with other assays or methods or studies the registrant have to uh, submit. And those are neurotoxicity studies, uh, developmental toxicity studies uh, in, in radiant and, and non-radiant species. Then we talk about carcinogenicity studies, uh, reproductive studies, gentox studies, which include the EMS test, the in vitro mammalian cell assay, uh, the cytogenetic micronuclear in vivo studies and so on. Uh, this is uh, a an, an field uh, I worked in during my PhD, as you probably know now. And so this is a point of interest to me also. And and so, uh, and, and also uh, the studies may include immunotoxicity studies in rodent species and animal metabolism studies. So there are a lot of uh, studies we assess uh, when we get an submission for uh, active ingredients. Now, moving on, um, this toxicology, as you probably understood, like from the beginning of 20th century, with no a little awareness about the toxicity of pesticides and how it can be regulated, we have come a long way. And now uh, we talk about TOX21, which is toxicity testing in the 21st century. And the primary aim of this is three R's replace, reduce, or refine animal use in research and testing. So basically it's talking about if we can replace the animal uh, tests, if not possible, we can we ref reduce them. And also if we can refine the animal use to make the studies more uh, effective to human uh, toxicity, uh, parameters and also to, to provide less 
harm to the animals. And so the big paradigm shift we are now seeing is, is the development of alternative methods. Uh, when we studied toxicology during our PhD or, or, or post PhD, we primarily dealt with in vivo uh, assays. And, and so far, I've mentioned mostly about the in vivo studies. But it's a new thing, but we're, we are moving away from in vivo assays to ex vivo or in vitro studies, in chemical studies also. And last year, during this time, last September, uh, Administrator Wheeler from US EPA uh, came up with this memo. And it, it, it is a, it, these are the three points which was I highlighted. Uh, they reduced the mammalian study request and funding, basically uh, 30% by 2025. So we have about five years to do that. Eliminate all mammalian study. This is a big jam from 30% to 100%. No mammalian study request and funding will be entertained by 2035. And for these, to make this visible, uh, the US EPA has come up with a big grant of $4.25 million to research, to, to, to promote research on, on NAMs, which are new alternative methods. And, and so this is uh, the way we are shifting uh, from the in vivo studies, uh, less animal sacrifice, less um, harm to the animals and more towards and also making those in vitro studies more related to the toxicity we see in the humans. So we are seeing in our department, we are seeing an increased submission of these in vitro toxicity studies. Most of those I have mentioned here uh, are, are the ones which have been approved to be used by regulatory agencies including federal agencies and state agencies. And so these are the examples, and, and you don't need to know all of these, but you can see here, uh, multiple of them have been already approved for primary eye irritation, but these are not in vivo. These are in vitro irritation studies. And you can see the source may be excised bovine cornea. Uh, it, this is a synthetic human cornea epithelium, uh, which mimics the actual human epithelium. And then you have the cytosensor microphysiometer assay, and, and then which basically uh, monitors the, the changes in the pH level and isolated chicken eye test. Similarly, uh, some of the approved tests for the skin cor corrosion assay, are uh, uh, skin irritation assays, a uh, transcutaneous electric resistant tint, TAR, uh, which uses a rat skin, a uh, disc of rat skin, uh, which measures the membrane barrier function. And, and the more the corrosive the, the chemical is, it will cause the loss of barrier function of that uh, membrane. The same thing with the membrane barrier test method for skin corrosion uh, uses a synthetic membrane. Uh, very, which again mimics the human skin. And then the in vitro skin irritation reconstructed human epidermis test method, uh, which is a, a reconstructed human skin, which uses a reconstructed human skin. Similarly, for the in vitro skin sensitization studies, uh, we have the direct peptide reactivity assay, which uh, measures the peptide depletion. And then you have the, the two studies which uh, look for uh, the genetics or the gene activation uh, following uh, uh, exposure to a sensitizer chemical, and then also activation of dendritic cells, uh, HCLAT. And these assays uh, are approved now, and, and, and we are seeing a, a few submissions also in our branch. Now, I want to clarify one thing. We are talking about like by 2035, we will not entertain 
any in vivo studies. So basically we're looking for 100% in vitro in chemical or ex vivo studies. So now the, the, the basis for development of in vitro studies is uh, one of the basis or the major basis is the AOP or the adverse outcome pathway. Without going into the detail of this graph, uh, what I can tell you that it, 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 it has three steps broadly. One is the initiation, like the interaction of the chemical with the, uh, you, 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 our body cells or our body tissues. And, and that initiation led to uh, some key events, as you can see here, and that key events, those key events ultimately led to the, the establishment or uh, the outcome or the final outcome or the final adverse outcome. And I'm taking an example of skin sensitization. Now AOP can, is, is basically, it's, it's being done for all the acute studies and it's not only done for toxicology, it's done for many diseases also, including cancers, thyroid disorders, and so on. So it gives you a mechanistic approach and gives you an understanding like where we can interfere and where we can develop, where is the scope for developing in vitro assays. So taking this skin sensitization AOP, the first, uh, the, the first thing is that definitely penetration and, and, and the chemicals which penetrate the skin, uh, we are dealing with sensitization. Um, they are mostly electrophilic. And that means they have a love for electrons. And, 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 and that's why they produce a covalent interaction with skin proteins and, and proteins which contains, uh, importantly, two residues, uh, two amino acids, cysteine and lysine, and that produces a covalent interaction. So that you may imagine as the initiation. And, and, and then that initiation lead to two things happening. One, into the skin cells, which are called keratinocytes, keratinocytes, and, and the other one is the dendritic cells. Now what is happening in the keratinocytes uh, or the skin cells is the, the, it, the activation of the cytokines. These are the molecules, which are chemical messengers, uh, which are the, the early products produced, uh, which ultimately lead to the immune response. And it also lead to uh, turning on of certain genes, which are protective in nature. And so there is a scope here you can see uh, for the development of, of in vitro assets. Now, so similarly, dendritic cells, uh, and, and you probably understand dendritic cells better than me uh, as a student of physiology. Uh, dendritic cells are basically uh, the exposure sites of a body like skin have dendritic cells which interacts with foreign molecules. And, and, and this starts uh, the, the the initiate the immune response. And so uh, the, what happens is that they, they produce the cytokines, surface molecules, and, and, and the dendritic cells get mobilized, which move from the epidermal or dermal layers of the skin to the lymph nodes, which initiates the fourth key event, and, and, and which is called antigen presentation in this pandemic era with COVID-19, you was probably a, a reading some articles about antigen presentation and so on. So what the dendritic cells do through a, a bridge, which is called histocompatibility complex, uh, they present the antigen to the T cells. So here is the, it's like, here is the villain, here is the culprit, and you need to walk and you need to get active now to kill that. And so that results in activation and proliferation of T cells, and which ultimately, uh, and, and so studying this activation or monitoring this activation, for example, can be a, a, a method, an in vitro method, which can be developed. So, and ultimately it will lead to the adverse outcome, which is inflammation, uh, upon challenge with the allergen, which can cause skin rash, blisters, and so on. And so each of these key events are highlighted here because 
in each of these key events, basically, there is a scope for development of in vitro studies. And you can see here some of these are already are used, but the research are going on all over the country and, and globally to find multiple assays, <coughs> sorry, uh, within a key event. So right now we have TG uh, test guidelines 442C. Let's go back to the previous slide. 442C is this direct peptide reactivity DPRA. <coughs> uh, that's using the covalent interaction with skin proteins. So basically what uh, this, this assay uh, uh, monitors is the depletion of a synthetic peptide, which is a heptamer, which is con consists of seven amino acids and so on. And similarly, now moving to the key event two, there's already a guidelines 442D, which is this one, and which takes care of these NERV2 luciferous test method. Basically, it, it monitors the induction of these genes, the protective genes. And NERV2 is one of that protective genes which are upregulated when an interaction or initiation of a sensitization uh, process starts. And so, so that is being monitored in that particular test. And, and similarly, for the key event three, 442E, there's the h clack thing you can see right here, 442E. And, and this is like they monitored a couple of dendritic cells, CD86 and CD54, uh, upregulation of those dendritic cells, uh, and activation and proliferation of those cells. And, and that's basically uh, is the test guidelines at 442E. Currently, there is no in vitro asset developed for key event four. Uh, this is the, the in vivo, the, the normal regular in vivo assay, which is used uh, till now. Uh, but we are hopeful that we will see uh, more new in vitro studies, not only for key event four, but also for the other key events. So this is just to explain like how uh, like as a student, if if you get interested to go into the toxicology field, you will be expecting a big shift from in vivo studies and studying those and interpreting those studies to more in vitro studies and using the those data and interpreting those data and so on. So this is is already happening and will happen in a, in a big, bigger way in, in future. Now, as everyone else, we are affected by uh, the pandemic uh, and uh, we started working remotely uh, from the middle of March. And a few times we go there uh, and in the US, like not like India uh, in the beginning of, especially the beginning of pandemic, we don't have complete 100% lockdown. So we, we were uh, traveling, but, but only for emergency reasons. So now the response which came from the federal body and from us, the state regulatory agency, is the activation of a document by US EPA, which is called Emerging Viral Pathogens Guidance for Antimicrobial Pesticides. Uh, this was activated, uh, basically reactivated, in, in the beginning of the pandemic, January 29. And, and, and this is the original document. You can, you can search that in, in, the, in the internet. And, and this was actually developed uh, in 2016 in response to the Ebola virus infection. And that was uh, deactivated later on. And, and then again reactivated in the January of this year with the beginning or onset of the pandemic. Now, th this is a two-stage process. Uh, it's the addition of emerging viral pathogen, in this case, irate COVID-19 claims in the product. So if you, if you think that your product will be effective against COVID-19 and you have to have scientific studies to prove that, then 
you can add that that claim that statement in in your uh, existing level or during new registration that you come up with a new product and you want to register you can add that this is effective against uh, covid-19 so that's the first stage and the second stage is that you can inform the public and uh, or the community uh, through different uh, sources like through their company website through social media through newspaper televisions radios and so on so uh, just just to to spread the disease that this product is 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 effective against covid-19 now all of these approved antimicrobials are added con continuously in a list which the US EPA has started which is called list n and this is the website if you hit this link you will go to that website and the the, the information will look like this this is the list n products with emerging viral pathogens and human coronavirus claims for use against sars cov 2 and and this is the data accessed uh, in june 15 and and this is an example of one of the products so this is a clorox product a disinfectant uh, the active ingredient is a quart ammonia and it's 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 basically is is used to kill rhinovirus and and so this was added to the list in march now this has to fulfill one of these three criteria basically it will be the best if it is studied against exactly the, the COVID-19 virus, or it was tested against virus which are similar to COVID-19 or even notorious than COVID-19, like most of the enveloped viruses, or it, 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 it has a proven efficacy against a different human coronavirus, uh, like a cold, common cold virus which is uh, also a coronavirus so so most of the, the the beginning was the second and the third one but now uh, nowadays we are seeing more of these the first one actual ex uh, actual efficacy studies uh, toxicity studies against the actual uh, covid-19 so so you federal EPA has has accelerated the review process. They they have reduced the time frame, and they're making it 50 times faster, uh, which is normally um, uh, less than a month. And similarly, we also are focused to expedite the review of similar submissions because it's not only that federal EPA has to approve them for to to be used in the state of California. It has to go through us, and we need to. Um, so we need to expedite the process of those products if they're they're valid products, if they are appropriate for use against COVID-19, they can be um, registered quickly. So we have an average time frame of two weeks uh, to do that. So right now, uh, when I started preparing this presentation, there was about 480 plus products in that list N, updated every week. And and to, I just saw today, and it's already uh, about 494 uh, products. So you can see like how much research uh, is going on to develop uh, these products, which can be effective against uh, the COVID-19 virus. And 23 of these products are being tested in the lab, uh, specifically against uh, SARS-CoV-2. And these are the, the first two products which were actually tested uh, against the COVID-19 virus. With that, I came to the conclusion of my talk. It was a pleasure talking to you. And I would like to thank my team, my fabulous team, and a very highly qualified individual, scientists, regulatory scientists. Uh, the, the active ingredient section is led by uh, Dr. Lewing, and and the product formulations section is led by Dr. Varma. And I am thankful to Dr. Varma for reviewing my presentation. 
And I also like to thank our brand chief, Dr. Diju, for always encouraging us with new ideas and new approaches and new studies. And, and also, And, and and feel free to contact me at this email, especially I like students to interact. If you like to know more about toxicology or the development of toxicology and how can you get involved in this field. And if you have any question, or, or we don't have time for questions. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your wonderful and very very informative presentation uh, we have questions but uh, we, are, we are lacking for time and if time permits we will discuss it at the last okay now yes yeah yeah and i can i can definitely answer those okay sir thank you sir. thank you so much now we are going to our next section the last speaker of today's session is Dr. Kubali Dhar, head of the department, uh, Department of Home Science, University of Calcutta. And the topic of our presentation is Bela Mia Bengalinis, an underutilized food source to address the new normal nutrition insecurity. I am requesting Dr. Amartya Roy, faculty of our department, to give a brief introduction about Madam Dr. Kubali Dhar. Please, Amartya. Thank you, Joydavi, for uh, the connection problem. Today, we are very fortunate and honored to welcome Dr. Kubali Dhar. Dr. Dhar currently serves as HOD of the Department Department of Home Science and Principal Investigator at the Laboratory of Food and Science and Technology Food and Nutrition Division, University of Calcutta, and Associate Faculty of Center for Research in Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. Her research involves in exploring different aspects of functional food and nano technology, her work in uh, physiology, uh, her uh, and lipid science makes her one of the few experts who have contributed significantly in development of novel nutraceuticals. Throughout her career, she has been honored with a number of awards for best research contribution in the field of physiology and applied sciences. Besides her research work for the last 20 years, she has been teaching both graduate and undergraduate students. So far, she has supervised 11 PhD theses and over eight students are presently working as a research student. With this hope that today also we will be enlightened by her work. Once again, thank you, Dr. Thor, for joining us. And now I am requesting you to present your talk thank over you. to you, ma'am. Thank you. Can you uh, see the slides? Yes, ma'am. Other side? Okay. Yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, very uh, a good, uh, good uh, afternoon uh, to all the delegates, my teachers, my students. Uh, thank you, organizers, for uh, giving me this chance, a second chance. I failed yesterday. Uh, for inviting me in this webinar and for giving me the second chance. I'm going directly to the topic as I'm a teacher, you, you know that I want to teach something to the students. There are many students in this uh, audience. When the whole world is fighting against COVID, uh, uh, it's a virus, we don't have many uh, drugs for it. So what we are uh, what we have, we have the, our immune system. And for the immune system, we need to have a balanced protein diet 
and protein must be balanced in our diets that so in this pandemic situation it is a jobless condition it is poverty and whole of india is su suffering uh, malnutrition and people are living in the uh, villages of india but in the villages we have some under utilized uh, uh, food sources protein food sources and bellamia bengalensis is one of them there are other sources also and we must uh, engage ourselves to find out these cheap protein sources and that can be utilized more and more so bellamia bengalensis is abundantly found in the rivers fresh water rivers lakes and canals and it is always uh, it is found throughout the year but uh, mostly in eight months of the year it is regularly taken by tribal population and some village po population and uh, of uh, india as well as in bangladesh now the current foodomic research uh, we are identifying the nutraceuticals and trying our best to establish the health promoting activities of the traditional foods so bellamia bengalensis is such a traditional food and we are trying and we are always trying to make our daily consumed food less toxic more healthy and fortified so uh, so the food research the food research is going on to maintain uh, the connection to find the relationship between food and maintain health prevention of disease or the therapeutics how food can be used as therapeutic agents so this uh, freshwater gastropod or the bellamia bengalensis is a major source of animal protein and tribal people they take this uh, this uh, protein and uh, it has some medicinal applications they apply it uh, as uh, as medicine against uh, for treating anemia asthma hypertension dysentery rheumatism tuberculosis arthritis so our my journey with bellamia bengalensis began in 2005 and dr shantinath late dr shantinath ghosh of chemical technology uh, 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 there's a dbt project uh, uh, funded by dbt and dr anadhi rao choudhury who is now the uh, lecturer of uh, sri rampur college and dr uh, arundhati bishash in us of usa uh, worked on this project uh, i was there and dr debashish bashu is a diabetologist famous diabetologist he was also there and uh, we had a patent uh, filed a next group who worked was roshnara misro So Dr. Roshnara Misro from Physiology Department, Dr. Shourab Bhattacharya is now in USA. He worked in his uh, uh, in this uh, work uh, in the under uh, Roshnara. And uh, when I joined the university in the Food and Nutrition Division, uh, Dr. Roshni Chatterjee, who worked under my guidance, and Dr. Tanmay De, they worked the last part of the last part. What I will tell, they have worked. It. the so bellamia bengalensis it's a very common uh, we uh, generally called it googly in bengal so it is a, a very it has a protein high amount of protein and the and a high amount of lipid also the lipid is nutritionally very very important because this lipid contains phosphatidyl serine of 12% phosphatidyl serine and a very few food products contains this amount of phosphatidyl serine uh, so the lipid is very very important for bellamia uh, for us another thing is that the saturated monounsaturated and the polyunsaturated fatty acid the ratio is 1 is to 1 is to 1 which is also very important because it is 
very near to the ideal ratio that all the dietary lipids must contain and the phospholipid contains high amount of polyunsaturated fatty acid and that means the the phospholipid all the pufa is uh, is stored in the uh, po, uh, in the phospholipid part now it has also a high amount of n3 fatty acid that makes the ratio of n6 is to n3 of 2.64 which is very near to the ideal ratio of 1.6 and in the other vegetable oils that we regularly take they all have more than 10 the ratio is more than 10 so we are getting a very near ideal ratio of 2.64 and phospholipid also the it is above 2 now uh, this is the fatty acid uh, profile of the lipid of bellamia bengalensis which shows that it contains eicosapentaenoic acid a very important omega 3 fatty acid that must we must have this epa in our diet and phospholipid also contains about 3.5% of eicosapentaenoic acid which is an omega 3 fatty acid now a dha is less in uh, in the fatty acid profile but it is more the more in the phospholipid uh, phospholipid amount so with this n3 fatty acid of 6% and 11% in the phospholipid it is the lipid composition is very very good lipid composition the lamia has so onadi uh, Uh, i'm calling him onadi as he is one of my students a bright student and uh, he has done the nutritional study with the phospholipids of this bellamia bengalensis the uh, the patent that were, uh, the patent was on the extraction of the uh, lipid from the process uh, uh, process patent the lipid extraction process was patented and uh, it is uh, it is uh, not uh, complete yet it is going on and uh, so this uh, this phospho with the phospholipid he has done the nutritional study i'm not going into detail he has also done done the nutritional study with the lipid part of the bellamia bengalensis and i'm not going into the detail and next uh roshnara uh, and his uh, student did uh, 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 in a, uh, how this uh, lipid acts against the delayed type of hypersensitivity they have done uh, 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 mice uh, uh, study in the mice model and it showed that it reduces the uh, ros the nitric acid production uh in peritoneal macrophages they measured the translocation studies and uh, they have showed that bellamia bengalensis lipid uh is uh, helpful in inhibiting the inflammation and uh, this uh, tribal people uh, they use this bellamia bengalensis against arthritis and rheumatism probably these studies can uh has established the scientific truth why this lipid acts in at the uh, at the organal level probably the lipid composition gives the answer it has a high amount of n3 fatty acids and also epa which may be the reason for this uh, for this uh, result now i am concerned with the protein part of the bellamia bengalensis the amino acid composition shows that it contains a sulfur containing amino acid similar to casein and it contains arginine which is higher than casein uh the serine 7.4 and glycine 9.9 much greater than casein so uh Mm, later on the nutritional study of uh, of um, onadi 
uh, he showed that it is hypocholesterolemic in nature. This protein has got hypocholesterolemic effect. Now, we found that uh, this methionine is to glycine ratio. It is very, very low, 0 0.02. And lysine is to arginine ratio is 1. And these two factors make a protein favorable as, as a hypocholesterolemic agent. So how the protein acts as hypocholesterolemic protein, this is the main key point that we have to, uh, that can distinguish between proteins from one protein to another protein, why it is acting uh, as hypocholesterolemic protein. Now, I'm concerned with the bioactive peptides. I know you are all uh, 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 waiting for lunch. So I will not take many a uh, 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 long time. So what are bioactive peptides? Bioactive peptides are small peptides that are encrypted within the protein structure. What the proteins, we have uh, different types of proteins in our food. And, and these bioactive peptides, they are encrypted within the protein amino acid uh, structure and we can utilize in vitro enzymes proteases to break these proteins food proteins and produce small peptide structures that have the different types of therapeutic functions so these bioactive peptides they have therapeutic roles, they have preventive roles, and these therapeutic uh, bioactive peptides, they, sometimes they are already present in the, uh, in the food. Like milk, and milk contains some peptides which are immunomodulatory, which are antimicrobial, which are antithrombotic, which are antioxidant, some are antihypertensive. So bioactive peptides have a, a lo whole lot of uh, roles and they, are, uh, they can be produced from food sources also. So uh, we can find out some peptides from milk. We can produce some peptides from sunflower protein, from soya proteins, from protein, uh, uh, porcine skin collagen proteins from seaweeds and from fish like uh, tilapia or so these uh, low cost food items they can be made a value added product or the nutraceuticals and uh, we can produce these nutraceuticals in our lab to produce uh, with the help of proteases enzymes uh, so we find in the different uh, uh, different uh, now stores, uh, and uh, we have we find the whey proteins, the neutralites, and all these. Uh, they 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 cost about for one kg. They cost uh, four thousand rupees sometimes, sometimes eight hundred rupees. Why? Why the cost is uh, one kg of uh, of uh, chana costs about a hundred rupees. So why this cost, uh, it also contains high amount of protein. The difference is that these protein powders, they have the protein isolates in them. And, uh, and sometimes they have protein hydrolysates. So or the bioactive proteins, bioactive peptides in them. So the cost is, uh, is 4,000 for one kg of protein powder. So the biological ac activities are antihypertensive, immunomodulatory, antimicrobial, antithrombotic, and antioxidant. So we uh, so um, with this, uh, it's it's our second paper, and uh, with Bellamia, it is our first paper in Journal of uh, Food Science and Technology, and uh, the work is on. Bellamia bengalensis protein.
and uh, this protein was uh, uh, the protein was isolated from the lamia bengalensis from googly um, by the process of uh, we made uh, we done, we have done uh, used different processes of protein isolation but not, but we have chosen the cheapest process and the best pro and the best uh, protein content that can be uh, isolated and it is about 92% and uh, and this uh, is uh, the ph uh, it's the isoelectric method and uh, after this isolated uh, protein we have hydrolyzed the protein by uh, using three proteases the papain the pepsin and the alkalase these are uh, proteases uh that can be used to produce the, to hydrolyze the protein now from the nutritional point of view the bellamia bengalensis protein is a very good protein uh we have uh, uh, calculated the essential amino acid index the protein efficiency ratio the biological value of protein the nutritional index and the amino acid score the amino acid score is 87% above 87% the biological value is above uh, 70% that is 78% and we consider the uh, biological value from uh, 70 to 100 to be a very good protein and excellent is uh, uh, egg egg protein and the biological value is above 90% but it is also a very good protein so this why do we hydrolyze these proteins nutritionally uh, they have the same effect that is the nutritional value there is no change in nutritional value but what is we what we are changing we are changing the physio physical chemical and the functional properties of the protein of the parent protein from the uh, bellamia bengalensis so the physical chemical pro when the physical chemical properties changes then all the other different properties of uh, of the protein change that is they will be easily digestible they will be easily uh, bioavailable bioaccessibility these all these uh, parameters they will change along with the physical chemical and the functional property changing the functional property and the physical chemical property and these proteins then can be used in different food products also so the hydrolysis uh, these are the methods of hydrolysis using papain and this is another protein alkalase which is a microbial enzyme a microbial uh, protease alkalase and papain you know it's a plant uh, uh, protease now we have done the degree of hydrolysis measure the degree of hydrolysis it is the ratio of cleaved uh, peptide uh, during the process of hydrolysis to the total number of peptide bonds contained in the protein mass and we found that alkalase has shown the highest degree of hydrolysis it is about 67 percent now this uh, this sds page shows that with alkalase and the lane six and lane seven very little pro uh, little peptides they are in the 10 kilo dalton range and most of them they are shorter than the 10 kilo dalton range uh, so uh, so the alkalis uh, have the have their best activity in uh, in hydrolysis in in the hydrolysis process so we measured then the solubility of the uh, bellamia bengalensis peptide hydrolysates so why we have done the protein solubility the protein solubility changes along with the hydrolysis the protein solubility is the result of the hydrophobic and the electrostatic interactions between the molecules. So with the increase of the electrostatic repulsion, 
than the hydrophobic interactions between the molecules solubility is increased and the performance of the protein in so where we are using these hydrolyzers we will be using these hydrolyzers in making food product like foams gels emulsions so that so the, uh, in the in that in those uh, uh, in those applications the protein solubility is very very important and we can predict the stabilization of the protein uh, solubility uh, with the help of the protein solubility so it it can be used as a predictor now we have measured the emulsifying activity of the uh, of the bellamia bengalensis hydrolyzers uh, we have taken the 60 minute product the 120 minute product of all the three enzymes and this shows that the hydrolyzed from papain the emulsifying activity index is maximum that is alkalis have made the peptides smaller but the smaller peptides does not mean that it will have it will be better emulsifying agent so partially hydrolyzed peptides partially hydrolyzed proteins with larger peptides they have the better emulsifying agents it is the capacity of the protein to emulsify the oil so each oil droplet will be encircled by protein peptides and it lowers the interfacial tension of tension and acts as a surface active agent so uh, the peptides uh, acts as emulsifiers so this is another uh, parameter foaming capacity the partial hydrolysis uh releases the polar and the hydrophobic hydrophilic groups of the protein changing the globular structure of the protein exposing the hydrophobic zone and influencing the fo foaming property so it uh, it is also used as a foaming agent these proteins will, can be used as a foaming agent these hydrolyzers now these hydrolyzers are then ultra filtered that is we passed it through a 3 kg membrane and we have taken the peptides shorter than the 3 kg so now we have a little purified form of the hydrolyzer and we have used these hydrolyzers for the hydroxyl radical scavenging activity so it's an antioxidative activity and we have found that the uh, again the papain have shown the hydroxyl highest hydroxyl radical scavenging activity so this is another antioxidant study with the hydrolyzers with the ultra filtered hydrolyzer now we wanted to study whether these peptides have any anti hypertensive effect or not so we have done an in vitro study we whether uh, here we have used the angiotensin converting enzyme we all we all the physiologists we know that it's a very important enzyme in the process of maintaining blood pressure and ac is now in the uh, ac2 is now in the uh, market Uh, it's very important for time in the pandemic situation with the virus and this ac we have used this hydrolyzer to find whether it has an inhibitory activity or not we found that alkalase hydrolyzer with more more short peptides in it have shown the greatest ic the lowest ic50 among the hydrolyzer we have also taken another drug which is a common drug lisinopril and it uh, you can see how uh, little how the ic50 is 0.19 so the our hydrolyzers we took the ultimately the alkalase hydrolyzer for the rest of our study 
for the inter uh, anti hypertensive activity we took this alkalase hydrolyzer at 120 minutes so we next did the uh, mass spectroscopy with the maldetoff instrument and it gave a number of peptides with their uh, uh, amino acid composition and these peptide sequences are then cross matched with the sequences enlisted in the http pdb database of the established ac inhibitory peptides isolated so our peptide 914 the sequence is this we have matched it with the already present ac inhibitory peptides in the database we have matched it we have matched the second peptide that we have in our peptide composition the amino acid composition was matched with the ac inhibitory peptide we have also these other four peptides and their amino acid composition was also matched but we chose this peptide for two reasons it is the uh, the uh, the high, it is it was in the highest concentration the peptide sequence is referred to as bell pep peptide for bellamia bengalensis peptide and uh, with the highest match also it has the highest match for two reasons the highest amount and the highest match and also it uh, now my student don my uh, yesterday told me that it has the highest hydrophobicity so as it has to go into the pocket of the ac ac the enzyme ac so it has to be more hydrophobic the hydrophobic amino acids must be present so it is another important point so so we chose this and we have and uh, the uh, it's a it's a company uh, the pepmi uh, from china peptides and they have made this uh, synthesized this peptide for us and it showed about 95 to 99% purity now the rest of the work we have done with this uh, with this pure peptide and we have uh, we have to validate our results that we have got whether it is ac inhibitory activity and to validate it we have done the thermodynamic analysis and the in silico modeling study now this belpip peptide which was one of the most concentrated peptide and was found to have the highest sequence overlap with the previously mentioned in the database so with this purified study when we did the in vitro study the result that we got of 57 microgram it came to about 7 microgram 7.5 microgram so it showed that purity have changed that uh, that uh, ic50 value so next this is the uh, uh, this is so uh, it shows mass spectrometry which shows that it is a 95% pure and the sequence of the uh, peptide so we did, next did the ac inhibitory kinetic parameters and this parameter showed that it is an uncompetitive type of inhibition belpep is not acting as a competitive inhibitor but it is acting as an uncompetitive inhibition uncompetitive inhibitor next we did the isothermal titration colorimetric analysis of the binding of the ac at uh, ac now the graph a uh, 
in the graph A shows a typical titration curve for the binding of HHL, the, that is the substrate, to the ACE under optimal condition as ACE hydrolyzed the HHL to hippuric acid. We measured the hippuric acid. And in isothermal titration calorimetry, we measured the energy release or the energy input. So it shows that it is an exothermic reaction. As the SE gets titrated with substrate, the catalytic sites progressively get saturated. As a result of the reaction, tended towards equilibrium, raw heat release diminished and only the background heat of dilution peaks remained as shown in the thermogram at the end of the reaction it tended towards achieving saturation and it caused the enthalpy change due to ad addition of moles of ligand to the enzyme solution at isothermal condition so in in the uh, in the a it is this type of curve that we are getting. But in the B, when we are adding this, uh, our Belpet peptide along with HHL and SE, what is happening? The, the exothermic reaction just uh, changed to endothermic, uh, endothermic reaction. The presence of the in in inhibitor Belpep, the exothermic nature of the A AC HHL reaction was changed to an endothermic pattern. And previous reports also had shown the similar exo endothermic pattern of thermogram. Then standard inhibitor, we have also done this study with the, our lisinopril, the drug of choice. And it also showed some endothermic pattern to inhibit AC and HHL. Interestingly, what we, what we are getting is that there are two uh, plateau. The first plateau here, and then the second plateau here. So it is, uh, uh, we, uh, we found, and uh, we tried to find out what's the reason. And the reason is that Belpip inhibited the enzyme substrate reaction uh, in a two step process in the two there are two sites for the binding of the bell pet and uh, when the first one binds it opens up another site within the ac and this observation was coherent to the uncompetitive inhibitory nature of the bell pet there is an initial slow process, but gradually there is increase in the rate of heat change with increase in the molar concentration of the ligand indicated towards the initial substrate binding of the AC molecule, which promoted the binding of the bell pipe to a secondary binding site to the AC as conferred by the sharp increase in the rate of secondary heat exchange. Change. So this portion, there is a sharp rise, and this shows that there is a two. It is a two-step process. The first, it binds to the uh, ACE one pocket. It opens up another pocket. It binds to the second, and there is a sharp rise. So we have done the in silico study. Whether our uh, uh, it, and this is uh, uh, and this is gaining importance and this is our uh, our peptide it is binding to the amino acids within the ac uh, ac uh, pocket and these are the amino acids that it is binding the uh, the histidine uh, the phenylalanine, the lysine, these are the amino acids with which these, uh, our peptide is binding. And this is the over, and we have overlapped it with the synthetic inhibitor, the lysinopril. It is more or less binding with, in, in the same pocket. 
but belpep was found to be involved in hydrogen bonding with amino acid residues aspartic 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 acid histidine tyrosine glutamine and these are the six amino acids which were not part of the s1 or the s1 dash or the s2 substrate binding pockets of se that are beyond these sub, uh, these pockets and uh, and uh, so uh, so this is an extra binding of belpep with the se and uh, the binding of the substrate to this core group of se within the close proximity of the zinc ions probably rearranged the group a little bit so that a second ligand binding focus locus was formed about 4 to 5 armstrong away from the active site zinc ion and this secondary binding locus was acquired by belpep to affect its uncompetitive inhibitory activity which was coherent to the enzyme kinetic data so we find that it is a two step process first one is it is binding to some of the amino acids in the pocket and it is opening a second a pocket and it is binding with some of the amino acids and it is acting in a uncompetitive manner so these are the conclusions and uh, the overall study helps to elucidate the nutritional importance as as well as the therapeutic outcome of the underutilized traditional food so this protein they have these peptides with it encrypted in the bellamia bengalensis protein we are just trying to focus on these peptides because they are the reasons for for uh, uh, they give the reasons why the this protein is being utilized for as traditional medicines by the uh, tribal people so it is very important that we uh, take these researches and uh, and in the scientific forum we establish scientifically uh, our traditional medicines our traditional foods uh, that we always seen that these have the uh, have specific specific effects but uh, it must be proved in in a scientific manner so we have done this work so thank you uh, uh, my team also so the uh, the all these all these uh, uh, these slides they were made by omrita uh, and uh, i think i have ended thank you very much ma'am for your nice and wonderful presentation as we are lacking of uh, time so the yes. question and session has been skipped uh, we are uh, requesting the participants please type your questions in chat box and we will forward them to the speakers and answer will be sent to you by your email id and uh, feedback form will be provided shortly and you have to fill it and you will get a certificate within 7 days now we have reached at the last part of the 3 days international webinar on translational physiology tom sale to system we anticipate that this webinar has helped us in gaining a depth of knowledge on the recent scientific updates in the field of physiology we were entirely enlightened by the experts of different domains of physiology and allied sciences who disseminated their scientific talks and we are sure it will help all the participants of this webinar sir and madam and all dear participants with your cooperation we will look forward for organizing such events on behalf of seminar committee and physiology department of anandamohan college in the near future now i would like to request Dr. Rupali Sharkar, Associate Professor, Department of Physiology, Anand Mohan College, to deliver valedictory address on behalf of the organizing committee of this webinar. Thank you, Joyita. Good afternoon, everyone. 
here we come to the end of our three days international webinar program organized by the department of physiology anand mohan college it is indeed a pleasure to be addressing this <coughs> virtual august gathering of students scholars faculties eminent professors and scientists from different fields of biology i consider it is privilege for me to deliver the valedictory address of this important and timely arranged international webinar on the translational physiology from cell to system i think this webinar will help to understand the changing environment surrounding us and to adapt our physiological system accordingly to meet the challenge for our student participants hello dears how can this kind of webinar enrich your life i think the major achievement of such webinar is the innovations students innovative ideas are always come in your mind and just note down them and inculcate and revise them to develop your knowledge your novel idea for research i would like to express my gratitude and sincere thanks to the speakers of our program who enlightened and enriched us sharing their knowledge and ideas today and the last two days professor tushar kanti ghosh professor b n mollik professor nilkanth chakraborty dr shourab bhattacharya dr a k chakraborty dr shavana rose choudhury dr vishwarup ghosh dr monemita patro dr niladri bhumik and dr kubali dhar thank you all once again sincere thanks to our principal dr pradeep kumar maiti chairman of the governing body dr korok kanti chaki and iqvc coordinator dr shandipan shen without their support and presence it was not possible for us to give this webinar such a good shape thanks to all members of our seminar committee for the support to make it success of course with special mention to dr joyita banerjee for her untiring effort extended thanks obviously to all the members of our department of physiology for such a happy ending and finally to wizard communications who helped us extensively to make the platform of this successful three days web webinar program thank you so much in fine i hope you will all enjoyed the technical session of this international webinar program throughout three days once again i express my sincere thanks to all and to the organizer for giving me the chance to share my views
हेलो जोईता जोईता हेलो हाँ हाँ मैम कंक्लूडेड ना हाँ 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 शॉप तो शीता हमने लीव कर चिदा ले ओके